class three wastewater collections license and is a certified backflow prevention assembly tester. Elijah graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in general studies from Texas Women's University in May 2020. Awesome. So Elijah, like I told you earlier, we will advance the slides for you. Just give me um, the, the word when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as Hannah said, my name is Elijah Dormany. I'm the Environmental Compliance Supervisor for the City of Irving. And I've been with the City of Irving for four years now. It started off as the Environmental Compliance Specialist in the FOG program and was promoted uh, before one year to Environmental Compliance Supervisor. So let's go ahead and begin. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to cover uh, four topics. The first topic is grease trap interceptor types. Uh, second topic, fog program administration, uh, ordinance considerations, and then we will get down to the nitty gritty on best management practices and inspections. Before we begin with our topics, I just wanted, <laughs> you can move forward, that's fine. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over the city of Irving uh, fat soils and grease program, give everyone a little bit of background and what we're currently doing now. So our uh, fog program started in the early 90s. Uh, back then, the primary focus was on liquid waste haulers, not the generator. Um, what really spurred more active participation from environmental compliance staff is participating in the TCEQ Sanitary Sewer Overflow Initiative. That began in 2007, and we're still waiting on our renewal um, agreement, which was submitted two years ago. And the goal for the program was reduction in grease-related SSOs. Uh, as you can see, you know, primary focus was on the liquid waste haulers. Our ordinance didn't really capture uh, minimum requirements for grease traps or interceptors until the late 2000s. Next slide, please. Now, our primary focus is the generator. We are active in the plan review, inspections, and enforcement uh, regarding the fat soles and grease program. Uh, like I stated, Earlier, we are still awaiting TCEQ approval for SSOI renewal. And in fiscal year 2019-2020, amidst, amidst uh, COVID, we completed 310 grease trap inspections. And now our goal is to reduce grease-related SSOs and educate Irving residents and businesses on the importance of proper waste disposal. Next slide, please. So ultimately, our goal is to prevent this from happening. This was a sanitary sewer overflow at a food establishment within the city of Irving. This, uh, this food establishment had a 15 gallon grease trap and unfortunately they had a very long sanitary sewer service which crossed a busy four lane uh, major thoroughfare in Irving. And the goal here is making sure everyone has proper grease traps and that they're maintained properly. Next slide, please. So what is a grease trap? And what is the primary function of a grease trap? Well, the primary purpose of grease traps is to prevent piping from becoming clogged with grease, uh, be it animal fats or hydrocarbons uh, that you would experience at a car wash or automotive repair facility. Uh, in regards to food establishments, there are three different types of grease traps or interceptors that are commonly used. The first being the gravity grease interceptor. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with gravity grease interceptors. Uh, Increasing in popularity now is the hydromechanical grease interceptors. These units are smaller and function hydromechanically in order to retain 
uh, grease. And then we're also encountering automatic grease recovery and removal units out in the field. Next slide, please. So this is a typical gravity grease interceptor. Um, you have your inflow, which hits the primary um, containment chamber. And the purpose of this primary containment chamber, chamber is to capture grease and any solids that may be leaving the wastewater line. And there, there is a separating wall with the gravity grease interceptors to slow the flow down in order to keep the effluent from becoming turbulent and removing any grease. So in this slide, we see a typical hydromechanical grease interceptor. Hydromechanical grease interceptors are typically smaller than gravity grease interceptors. They do have flow control devices on the influence of the of the hydromechanical grease interceptor. Hey Elijah, yes. sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Can we just remind everybody who maybe just exited and came back to uh, please mute your microphone so that we don't have any echo or feedback for Elijah? Thank you. We'll go ahead and resume. So in the hydromechanical grease interceptor, like I stated, these um, units are typically smaller than gravity grease interceptors. And what we will notice on most units is instead of gallon capacity, they will illustrate uh, the amount of pounds of fog storage or grease storage that they are capable of removing. Next slide, please. And then lastly, we do run into uh, from time to time automatic grease recovery and removal units. Uh, typical uh, brand name out there is called the Big Dipper. These units are typically small and kept under three comp sinks or in our in our case, um, some of our high rises will have an automatic grease recovery unit for small kitchens uh, within the facility. These units have a heating element and a pump which removes the grease from the uh, top of the chamber and puts that grease into a separate container requiring proper haul off or disposal. Next slide, please. So now we're getting into the fat soils and grease program administration. And the first thing I wanted to touch on regarding any FOG program is how you keep your data. Accurate data is critical for the success of any FOG program. It's important that you implement some software solution or build a database in-house to um, maintain all of your information and pump out data. Some key information to consider when you are um, maintaining your database is the year built of any grease trap or interceptor fixtures, uh, how many floor drains, how many hand sinks, what flow capacity is entering into that grease trap. And you could also include any special circumstances regarding the facility or the installation of that grease trap. Type of grease trap, whether it be hydromechanical, gravity, or an automatic recovery unit. Sewer drainage basin, those wastewater operators out there who uh, feel that this information is important, uh, you can definitely capture that within your FOG database. Dimensions of the trap and the interceptor, and any inspections or the last inspection performed at that facility. And lastly, how often will you complete your inspections? Here at the City of Irving, we have a Certificate of Occupancy Inspection Program, and our goal is to try and inspect every grease interceptor within seven years. Next slide, please. So this is an example of how uh, we keep our data. We use a um, third-party software called Linko, which also houses our industrial pretreatment data, as well as our liquid waste hauler information. So you can see here we have our um, 
facility number, facility name, the address of the facility, and several fields that uh, we complete in-house, whether the uh, facility is active, its classification, which in this case would be food, and then secondary class would be fast food. Daily flow at this location is unknown, but that's something we are capturing now. And all, below you can see all of the pump out data from this facility. Next slide, please. This is a, another facility and the detailed information we have regarding its grease trap. As you can see, this facility has a hydromechanical grease trap rated at 250 gallons. And we even included the extractor description, uh, including the, um, the, the manufacturer of the grease trap. Next slide, please. And once again, this is the detailed information. So we have manufacturer poly, um, cleaning frequency quarterly, the extractor description, and the depth of the grease trap and its compliance intervals for the 25% rule. We also have the install date of this grease trap captured in our database. Next slide, please. The next um, consideration for any FOG program would be who is conducting plan reviews. So who will ensure that the proper installation and sizing requirements are met for your city? Here in the city of Irving, we have an environmental compliance inspector who is responsible for reviewing all new installs uh, for any industrial, fast food, restaurant facility. And what we uh, review during this plan review process is the proposed trap must meet our minimum requirements based on our ordinance, which we recently revamped to include um, a minimum of 500 gallons be installed at any establishment. But there's a caveat to where you also have to meet flow requirements. And of course, we have to include some variance process. And with our variance, if a facility wants to install a smaller grease trap, then what is required, it requires our director approval. And typically we have a meeting with the director explaining the situation, the special circumstances, and why this facility should or should not receive their variance. And one thing we have found out is that when the water utility conducts the plan review, we have a vested interest in knowing what will be installed and making sure that it meets our minimum requirements. Because ultimately our goal is to reduce sanitary sewer overflows as a result of grease blockages. Next slide, please. So here is a, a typical plan review drawing that we will receive. Uh, you can see the four inch grace, grease lines uh, within this facility. This is actually a, a um, grocery store that updated their facility and installed a larger grease trap. Next slide, please. And sometimes we get them drawn in Microsoft Paint. This facility, you can see we don't have any um, floor drains highlighted. They were kind enough to include a three sink, uh, well, three compartment sink, hand sink, and mop sink on the drawings. And another thing that isn't on this plan set is our required sample well to be installed after the grease trap. However, they did include that they were going to install a 1,000 gallon grease trap. Next slide, please. And lastly, we typically look for a specification sheet within these plan sets. I've come across numerous plans who um, will call out for a 1,000 gallon grease trap installation. 
But in the spec sheet, they'll have a hydromechanical grease trap of either 75 gallons or 250 gallons. And uh, you really need to call out the contractor or the architect or whomever is submitting the plans on finding out what is actually going to be installed. One thing we have started doing here at the city of Irving is within Linko, our database, is capturing this plan review, well, plan data and putting it into our database. So in the future, if we ever need to take a look at those plans, we have access to them. Next slide, please. The, another important consideration for any FOG program is inspections. Inspections allow you to have that boots on the ground approach in identifying malfunctioning or poorly maintained grease traps. Here at the city of Irving, we do have a two prong approach. We have compliance inspections, which initially um, will respond to complaints or random inspections or even liquid waste haulers reaching out to us saying, hey, you may wanna go take a look at this grease trap. I think a baffle wall is deteriorated. They're missing an inlet, T, um, and really that is a good source of information is from your liquid waste haulers. They also um, like to report people that don't pay their bills. <laughs> and with that, they will tell you, okay, yes, this grease trap is malfunctioning and you should probably do something about it. And the inspections give us an opportunity to educate rather than enforce. That is one mantra we have at the city of Irving in regards to our program is educating the business owner before taking any enforcement action, making sure they understand that, hey, you need to maintain this grease trap. And if you don't, you know, there will be consequences, but giving them that opportunity to correct it before any enforcement action is taken. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, city of Irving's inspection form. Um, we do utilize this form for grease and or grit trap inspections. And one of the things we capture is the equipment in use. So if there's any commercial dishwashers, cooktops, waste oil containers, um, we also want to capture the number of floor drains, the number of sinks, and then the number of three comp sinks. On this form, it's important important to capture, you know, the facility description, the inspection date, whether or not you found any um, items that need to be corrected, capturing the facility representative. And one thing that's important to us now is capturing the email for the facility. Since we have adopted online trip ticket entry forms, and the software will allow us to email reminders to the generator on getting their uh, pump out completed. Next slide, please. Communication is another key important aspect of a successful FOG program. Communication with other city departments is critical for your FOG program, uh, especially with your plumbing inspections department, the health department, code enforcement, and other um, water utilities personnel. Uh, we often get calls from our health department, you know, regarding facilities saying, you know, hey, y'all may want to come take a look at this facility. You know, they may not be draining properly. And we also have established a procedure to where if we come across a facility that is either uh, causing an SSO or they are experiencing a backup, that you know as a courtesy we will contact the health department and they ultimately shut down the facility until the grease trap or the sewer line is maintained and flown properly and we root routinely have meetings with all of the points of contact from each division um, just maintaining that open line of communication with everyone and making sure that we're all aware of any ongoing projects any ongoing compliance issues or anything um, we may experience out in the field that we're not familiar with. Next slide, please. 
And regarding to um, sanitary sewer overflow response, we, the city of Irving, conduct a monthly SSO review meeting. And in this meeting, we go over the root cause of each SSO, the resolution of the SSO, and then any follow up needed. And this has um, really been a helpful tool, especially with my staff and I. If operations comes across um, a problem area or a problem wastewater main, and it has a lot of grease, we will go out there and take a look at all of the grease traps. And as a result of this, um, we are currently working with the facility to try and replace their grease trap. But your water utilities field ops personnel can be a, a valuable tool in finding out who um, is not in compliance with their pump out intervals, or if a facility needs a larger grease trap or they're not maintaining um, their equipment properly. Next slide, please. Another important consideration is your ordinance. Uh, what requirements and limitations do you have regarding your enforcement? Um, key things to consider is, do you have a requirement to install a grease trap? Do you have minimum maintenance intervals for your grease traps? Is there a minimum sizing requirement or do you reference plumbing code to ensure that facilities aren't installing 10, 15 gallon grease traps? Do you have enforcement capabilities? Uh, with enforcement capabilities, do you have right of entry, the right to sample? And if you do have the right to sample, where can you sample from? Here at the city of Irving, our compliance sampling has to be end of pipe but we do require the installation of sample wells after the grease trap. Next slide, please. Some regulatory considerations regarding your FOG program. Uh, first being the TCEQ Sanitary Sewer Overflow Initiative. Um, everyone in the region should be familiar with the TCEQ SSOI. And if you uh, are currently a participant, you know one of the things that they request from you is how many grease traps you have inspected for the previous year. And another thing is any updates to your liquid wa waste management ordinance and <clears throat> any updates regarding your grease abatement program. Excuse me. The next regulatory consideration is the EPA CMOM, which is Capacity Management Operations and Maintenance. This is an in-depth guide on operating wastewater collection systems and treatment. Then we'll analyze if you have a grease abatement or management program in place. And then lastly, the TMDLI plan for the Greater Trinity uh, River Region list the participants or non-participants of each program. And this is outlined in our TMDL I plan as a way to reduce SSOs in the region and bacteria loading. Next slide, please. So now we are getting into the BMPs and what to look for while you're conducting your inspection. And this is what started our plan review process. Uh, this facility was a convenience store and they had a 25 gallon grease trap installed in the middle of the store. Um, you know, stuff like this shouldn't be happening, but sometimes it does. And this is what uh, gave us the um, capability to initiate the plan review process to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Next slide, please. Uh, BMPs regarding sampling. Um, this is a sample well after a hydromechanical grease trap. As you can see, we can sample from that sample well. And in this uh, scenario, we were sampling for oil and grease. Next slide, please. Some more uh, sampling. Uh, this was in response to a hazmat spill and finding out um, what may have been discharged into the oil water separator. And as a result of our sampling, um, 
you know, we determined that everything was kept within the facility and didn't make it into the sanitary sewer. Now, th this one was tricky, though, and one thing to consider while you're sampling is um, the viscosity of the fluid in the grease trap. And although this was an ideal um, scenario to sample from, we were able to capture a sample. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing to look for whenever you're inspecting a grease trap is whether or not they have uh, proper ring and lids. In this case, uh, I, I really don't know who decided to try and repair this grease trap <laughs> with this ring and lid. You can see they tried putting some roofing tar around the top of the concrete ring. And the biggest thing to consider when you're looking at ring and lids is any uh, opportunity for inflow and infiltration. And obviously this will not keep out any rainwater and it could pose a safety risk if someone were to, you know, improperly step on it or forget to close the lid and there is no ring there. Next slide, please. Another thing um, while you're out there inspecting is, is the uh, lid in proper working condition. This lid, um, when we uh, encountered it out in the field, you could not open it and it appeared that someone tried opening it before and ended up breaking the lid, thus resulting in a hole in the lid. Now they did try and cover it up with some duct tape and fiberglass material, but still this grease trap isn't being maintained properly because you cannot open this lid and it's posing a health, um, a health risk and also uh, allowing water to inflow into the grease trap, which may cause bypass or surcharging. Next slide, please. This uh, BMP inspection found that the grease trap was overflowing and on top of that, the grease trap was undersized. This was for a popular sandwich uh, shop and it was only a 15 gallon grease trap. And that's one thing we, uh, we commonly encounter here at the city of Irving because there was really no focus until the late 2000s on what type of grease trap or interceptor was installed. And we do have quite a few of these um, steel grease traps installed either within the facility or on the exterior of, the, of this establishment and trying to work with the uh, business owners on getting these repaired and maintained properly. Next slide, please. Another uh, instance of overflowing uh, cleanouts. If you see this, uh, you do know that there <laughs> hasn't been uh, any maintenance on the uh, grease trap and thus resulting in uh, blockages downstream on their service line. In this uh, instance, we had our operations crews respond and until we could get a plumber on site, they were actually vacuuming up the spilled wastewater for the entire strip center until the plumber could unstop the line. And that that is typically how we respond to um, private SSOs. We will utilize city resources to keep the SSO from entering into the MS4 storm drainage system just to lessen the impact. Next slide, please. Another instance of a poorly maintained grease trap. This one is a um, steel grease trap. As you can see, the baffle wall is deteriorated and there is no T, thus allowing um, the oil and grease to just immediately go into the discharge. Um, one thing you want to look for on these traps is making sure they do have that maintenance T. Excuse me. 
Next slide, please. This is a um, grease trap that we encountered out in the out in the field. Um, the facility owner did not know he had a grease trap. It wasn't captured in our database. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we uncovered it and opened it up, it definitely needed uh, replaced because it hadn't. I would assume had never been maintenanced since we had no record of it and the uh, business owner had no record of it as well. Next slide, please. Here's another instance of improperly maintained grease traps. Uh, this grease trap, we had to increase the maintenance interval from three months to every month. And on the next slide, Once we conducted the 25% uh, rule inspection, uh, we found that it did not meet the 25% uh, rule, thus resulting in increased pump outs. It's hard to tell from these photos, but on the left, you can see that the facility had over two foot of solids in the grease trap. In the, um, the grease level was over one foot which is illustrated on the picture on the uh, right hand side of the slide. Next slide, please. This is a, another grease trap that we encountered. We had no record of installation and uh, it, had, it had been in place for about two years. You can see fungi, mold, um, all sorts of nasty stuff growing within this grease trap. And one thing we like to do is whenever we come across um, situations like this, is making sure that the liquid waste hauler uh, shows up and we can monitor the pump out. Next slide, please. And this is that same grease trap getting maintenance. Next slide, please. Another um, improperly maintained grease trap. This facility we had again had no record of, and it had been vacant for several years. And when the uh, new facility, uh, which was a uh, bakery, was moving in, wanted to determine if this uh, grease trap was salv salv salvageable. <laughs> And what we found is it was sal salvageable, but this uh, lid on the um, right hand side of the screen, um, we had a hard time trying to open. But on the next slide, um, once again, we met the liquid waste hauler out there. He was able to open it with some help in the uh, grease trap, the um, it was a gravity grease interceptor and all of the concrete was in good working order. Baffle wall was intact and the uh, maintenance tees were also intact. So the facility was uh, spared the expense of having to install a new grease trap. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is a, another example of an improperly maintained grease trap. Once again, we had to have this facility increase their maintenance intervals, and you can see that we're dangerously close to bypassing on the effluent. And what I mean by bypassing is the uh, grease layer on the top is right at the uh, top of the effluent T. And Ideally, you want the grease layer to remain below that effluent T or else you will have a bypass and the oil and grease from that uh, grease trap will end up in the service line. And ultimately into your wastewater main or treatment plant. Next slide, please. Other BMPs we take a look at is how they're handling their waste management. Uh, this facility was um, discarding food scraps behind their um, 
their establishment. And, you know, this is a health hazard and then also um, affects RMS4. So, you know, it's definitely something we enforce since we have the capability to enforce um, stormwater violations as well whenever we're doing our inspections. Next slide, please. This facility had outside food storage and they were also disposing of oil and all sorts of nasty stuff in their dumpster. Um, we did end up getting our health department involved in this one and um, the facility was closed and they had to discard all of the food within their storage container. And that's why it's important to have, um, you know, good communication with your health department if you aren't attached to a health department for your inspections. Because if you come across a nasty kitchen or, you know, you have any, um, you have any background in health department inspections, you can let them know and make them aware because, you know, outside food storage can cause a lot of issues. Next slide, please. This is the uh, same establishment. They were cleaning the kitchen out in their facility, having it pressure washed. And you can see that all of the water was exiting the back door of the facility and then making it into our MS4. Uh, this facility did receive a notice of violation to correct all of their issues and they were ultimately in compliance by the end of the day. Next slide, please. Oil storage containers. Um, they come on in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Uh, most typically found in uh, 55 gallon barrels. And you can either find them on the inside of the establishment or on the outside. Next slide, please. And this is why we take a look at them. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> they uh, they had some issues with trying to make the oil and grease into the container. And you know, we we all want to make sure that this doesn't happen and wind up in our waterways. Next slide, please. Again, improper oil storage. Uh, making sure that this doesn't happen. And those of you who are doing inspections, you know, sometimes I will take a look at the uh, dumpster, just make sure they're not dumping any oil or grease. And it's always one thing to consider. Next slide, please. Floor drains. Once again, these come in all different sh uh, shapes and sizes and in this uh, instance, it was installed in a bar area. There were no deficiencies found, but it did smell um, rather bad, and we advise that they may want to uh, clean their floor drain out in this area. Next slide, please. Uh, three comp sink uh, discharging into this floor drain. As you can see, it has a strainer, and it looks fairly uh, good. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Next slide, please. Uh, one important thing to consider is if you're in the kitchen area doing BMP inspections on floor drains, uh, they can be hidden very well under uh, all of the equipment within the kitchen. So at times you may want to duck down under a ice cream machine or deep fryer and make sure that you know, there are no issues. Next slide, please. Strainers. This is one of our biggest things that we look for within the kitchen. Uh, this strainer, it's iffy on the install, but at least they have one um, in place. As you can see, there is also a paper towel next to the floor drain so we reminded the um, business owner on proper disposal and making sure that paper towels weren't winding up 
in their wastewater line. Next slide, please. This is what we don't want to see. Um, the strainers thrown to the uh, left of the sink and not within the floor drain. Next slide, please. Now, this one is iffy with the strainer, but there is no air gap on the uh, discharge line. Now, um, I'm not saying everyone needs to, you know, conduct a customer service inspection or look for potential backflows, but it's one thing to consider. And what happened in this case is that they had to repair their sweet tea. And with that, the plumber um, decided to extend the discharge line into the floor drain. So we asked the business owner if he could have the plumber come back out and raise it to where that, well, to meet requirements and have a, an appropriate air gap going into this um, floor drain. Next slide, please. Uh, mop sinks, you always want to make sure that you take a look at them, uh, make sure there's no improper storage. Uh, it really depends on how uh, your plumbing inspectors operate. We're adamant that mop sinks should be tied into um, grease traps. However, our plumbing inspector, you know, at times asks, calls us out for it and says, you know, they really should be tied into um, the domestic waistline instead of the grease trap. But our uh, primary concern is making sure there's no improper um, dumping and if it does happen it goes into the grease trap next slide please another typical mop sink you can see that this mop sink has a strainer there are some backflow concerns but like i said not everyone is familiar with backflow and if you come across anything that looks like this you know calling either a plumbing inspector or water utilities personnel familiar with backflow and has appropriate licenses or uh, certifications would be helpful. Next slide, please. Three comp sinks, making sure that they're in working order. Uh, the discharge lines are going into an appropriate drain. Next slide, please. Hand washing sinks. Uh, we require all hand washing sinks to be tied into the grease trap but making sure that they're in working order. Um, you know, just customary inspections. Since I'm in the uh, kitchen, I want to make sure everything is in working order. Next slide, please. Prep sinks, another uh, key consideration, uh, making sure they flow properly, are uh, properly tied into a drain. Next slide, please. Grills, uh, typically uh, we don't run into any issues with grills, but making sure that you uh, take a look at the facility, capturing that information if you so require it on your inspection form. And then lastly, deep fryers on the next slide. And if you come across deep fryers, making sure that they have a way to uh, properly dispose their cooking oil. And then with the next slide, thank you uh, for your time this morning. And Hannah, do we have um, an opportunity to answer a few questions or do we need to move on to the next presentation? We definitely have time for questions. Um, so you had a few come in and I can read them off to you if you would like that. But we'll start okay. with, with Echo's question here, uh, why do you prefer to sample at the end of pipe instead of a sample well? So for compliance reasons um, within our ordinance and um, we require compliance samples to be taken at end of pipe, but at the sample well, we do analyze for pH and oil and grease just to make sure that the grease trap is operating efficiently. However, if we uh, need to take a compliance action against the facility, it has to be end of pipe. And I hope that answers your question, Echo. 
All right. Uh, do you, this is from Jennifer Flood, do you conduct any other analytical testing other than that oil and grease routinely? Um, we do on occasion do BOD TSS for surcharge reasons, but most of the time it's oil and grease and pH. Awesome. Um, I'm going to skip down to the bottom. Uh, Echo said, yes, thank you. pH range required? Question mark. Yes, pH range required. And I see that uh, she had a previous question of oil and grease limits. Um, we rely on our um, discharge permit of 250 milligrams per liter. Awesome. Okay. And then how many grease, total grease traps or FSEs do y'all have? How many inspectors? And that's from Casey Nettles. Uh, okay. So grease traps, including grit traps, were at over 1,800. And we have one inspector. All right. <laughs> And then follow up question for the pH. What is your pH range criteria? 5.5 to 11. All right. I'm just going to keep shooting these at you from Devin Jones. Does your public works department provide their vacuum truck for SSO remediation or does your department have a vacuum truck? We do not have a vacuum truck, but uh, the water utilities department has several. And it's always been um, within our um, procedure that whenever we encounter a pub, well, private or public SSO, that we immediately set someone up to vacuum. And then my guys will go out and assess the uh, MS4 for any environmental impacts. But um, it is water utilities that provides the vacuum truck. And we're uh, we're currently working with legal. We've been going back and forth on trying to find a way to pay for these crews to be out there. Um, whenever you tell them, we, well, we did try the hazmat route, and that doesn't work out too well because these hazmat contractors want a lot of money just to um, respond. So, you know, it's an ongoing working process, but hopefully that answered your question. Okay. From Alexandra, you mentioned that when you enter the grease trap information into the city software, service frequency type, et cetera, you capture the installation date. Where do you get this data from? Well, on our um, older grease traps, we don't have that data, but on newer facilities going forward, um, we utilize either the plan review date or the inspection date. We generally know on the new facilities uh, when the grease trap was installed. And if we have any questions, we can always pull up our uh, plumbing permit or the inspection report from the plumbing inspector. Awesome. Okay. Um, we have a comment from Tad. Please explain the maintenance intervals divine, defined in your ordinance. So uh, we recently updated our um, liquid waste ordinance. And what we included was um, grit traps are every six months and then grease traps are 90 days. Now we have the option to increase those, well, to decrease those intervals depending upon, you know, the 25% rule inspection uh, whether or not they're exceeding the oil and grease limits, um, pH limits. So we do have the option to increase the intervals. And on a lot of the smaller grease traps, they're either biweekly, uh, sometimes weekly, or monthly pump out intervals. It's all dependent upon when you do the inspection and find out if it's actually working. Now we have worked with the facilities before and you know, if they were having issues going back one month after the pump out, two months after the pump out, and then three months, kind of gauging whether or not they can maintain that 90 day interval or if we needed to increase it. 
Awesome. Okay, so we have, we'll do one more question here um, and then we'll need to move on. I'm going to put the remaining questions that we didn't get to, we'll hold on to those until the roundtable session. Um, but we need to go ahead and get moving. So my last question for you, Elijah, is 1,800 traps and one inspector. How many do they get to each year? Well, that's why we have a lofty goal of every trap being inspected within seven years. And 2019-2020, um, uh, um, we got to 361 of those. Awesome. Thank you. And so, Casey, I have your question as well as Tad. Um, and Echo, I saw that your question got answered in the chat box. So we'll hold on to those ones until the round table. Um, but thank you so much, Elijah. We'll, we'll come back to you in a little bit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Awesome. Okay, so our next presenter is Madison Dunn. Uh, she is the environmental coordinator for the city of South Lake. Prior to becoming a coordinator, she interned under the Environmental Services Division to build a foundation for resource conservation regulatory requirements from, from a municipality perspective. The Fats, Oils, and Grease program is one of the main programs she oversees in addition to stormwater management, water conservation, and drinking water quality. She received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of North Texas, along with additional education focuses in technical communications and Peace Corps preparation. So Madison, um, I know you're not going to turn your camera on, but just let me know whenever you are ready and we'll get rock and rolling. Looks like she might have had to reconnect here. So we will give her just a minute to get reconnected. Elijah, if you would like to take another question <laughs> while we wait on Madison to join us again. Yeah, I can answer uh, Casey's question. Okay, so great. The um, electronic trip ticket entry form, we still require the liquid waste hauler to provide a paper manifest to the generator. So that covers the uh, TCEQ requirements. We're not using digital signatures. All it is is they're essentially inputting the information from the um, generator form into our um, online entry portal. And we don't require the, uh, the hauler to send us that paper manifest anymore. We're solely all electronic, but we do require them to leave a copy at the generate at the generator at their facility so whenever we do inspections we can review them um, i did go over this a little bit in our uh, water meeting back in november but casey i think you still have my contact information so if you would like for us to demo anything to you just reach out to me and then tad uh, we do not have a variance for large engineered oil water separators at industrial facilities. Um, now, we do require um, traps to be installed, but we rely solely upon that plan review process and making sure that whatever they do install, um, it meets the minimum flow requirements. I can say one facility we had to have them install uh, 15,000 gallon grease trap because of the um, operation and the flow that they had at their facility. Thanks, Elijah. Okay, I see Madison, you have made it back on. So hopefully we can get your presentation going. Yes, thank y'all. I'm so sorry. My connection literally gave out right as I was about to turn over, so I jinxed myself. But um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hannah, and thank you for everybody who's online today who's um, here just to learn a little bit more about grease interceptors. Um, that was a great presentation, Elijah. I'm actually really excited to give that back to the FOG meeting to show them. Uh, what's been going on in Irving. Um, so hi, my name is Madison Dunn. I'm the environmental coordinator here in the city of South Lake, and I'll be presenting on grease interceptor replacement, repairs, and then some of our city of South Lake BMPs. I'm fairly new to the fog world, so I'm excited just to share what I've kind of learned along the way and to see what everybody else is doing. Next slide, please. 
I just wanted to give a little background on the city of South Lake. So we are located south of Grapevine Lake and just northwest of the DFW Airport. Our population is about 33,000 people, and we have a very high density of retail and restaurants in our area, so that pulls people in across the Metroplex daily, which generates a lot of wastewater. Our wastewater drains to two different basins, so we drain our northern portion of the city to TRA Denton Creek and then to TRA Central for our south southern portion of the city. So that picture on the bottom just shows the difference in the drainage basins, the kind of the border from where it switches from an oil grease limit for the northern portion and then the southern portion. And then the map on the right is actually a recent GPSing project where we went out and located every grease interceptor that we had in the city. And as you can kind of tell, there's a high density along our main corridor that goes through South Lake. Next slide, please. So now I'll talk about what we're doing in South Lake as far as best management practices. Next slide, thank you. All right, so um, in 2017, South Lake created our initial and first fog team. So this includes expertise from wastewater, environmental, and administration. We meet bi-weekly to discuss inspections, sampling events, opening and closures of different restaurants, enforcement, and then other pretreatment items as needed. Next slide, please. This is our present day fog team. So we have Jason on the left. He is our wastewater supervisor. He oversees violation notices. He monitors our budget for sampling and coordinates with TRA regarding our limits. And then Terry is our wastewater crew leader. He performs inspection. He attends sampling events and he acts as a li liaison between liquid waste haulers and then our business owners. Kim is our office assistant and she creates compliance letters. She digitizes our manifest data for our records and acts as a liaison with liquid waste haulers. My role with the FOG team is permitting liquid waste haulers in South Lake, assisting with interceptor sizing requests, and then making sure that any type of regulatory compliance is met within our city. And then Emma and Cassie are the environmental services interns and they attend sampling events. They analyze sampling reports that come in. They assist with inspections and they welcome all the new businesses that come to South Lake within our FOG program. So our team coordinates very closely with other city departments, such as building inspections. With this relationship, we've been able to perform um, inspections before reviewers grant any type of occupancy permits so that we can check in on the structural integrity of the grease interceptor in between tenants. We also coordinate closely with code enforcement because they help us execute different compliance strategies with establishments. Next slide, please. Another thing that we participate in is sampling and inspections of our interceptors. So our sampling and inspection procedures are scheduled on a quarterly basis. We originally began our list generation geographically, so we would group lists of establishments that were close together and then sample and inspect based on that. We're since then having, uh, we've had about 81% completion of getting a sample and inspection per each trap. So we're beginning to just group establishments based on whether or not they've had um, an existing inspection or if they're a new business to South Lake. So our process begins with an initial letter to the establishment, just letting them know that we're gonna be by to sample soon and that they need to haul their waste within the next month. We then schedule a time to go out with our contracted lab to analyze each establishment for oil and grease, BOD and pH. Then after sampling and cleaning have occurred, we'll return and inspect the cleaned interceptor. And for this inspection, we specifically look for surface and structural condition of the internal and external aspects of each trap. So interceptors can pass. They can pass with recommendations for rehab or replacement or fail an inspection. The threshold between passing with recommendations and failing is based on a probe test. So we have a rod and we'll scrape the actual inside of the interceptor to determine the integrity of the rock against the sidewalls and baffle walls. Our communication route typically follows an initial letter and then a passing letter for inspections, which is the easy route. Um, but then for any type of violations that occur, it'll start with an initial letter, a first notice of violation, then we proceed to hand deliver a second notice of violation and then a citation at that point. Next slide, please. 
Another BMP that we have is our Welcome to South Lake folder. So as I said earlier, our interns visit each restaurant to welcome them to South Lake. So this is what I mean. Um, they will scan our monthly new business list and schedule a day and time to visit any new restaurants or other fog producing establishments. They'll speak with the manager, welcome them to the area, and then explain the contents of this folder after they provide it to them. These folders include a fog BMP list for commercial kitchens, a clean at right brochure, a list of permitted Lakewood waste haulers in South Lake specifically, information on our environmental services division, a cross connection and backflow brochure, a water conservation for businesses and industries brochure, and then a contact card. This is also a good opportunity for our interns just to remind these restaurants that they are on a 90 day cleaning schedules for all grease interceptors based on our ordinance. Next slide, please. So here are some outreach initiatives that we have for FOG currently. Our holiday grease roundup has been the main event that we've been able to share information with our residents about the importance of FOG and what goes down the drain. Earlier this year, we incorporated fog related questions into environmental trivia at a backyard party event. We asked the kids questions as such as, um, is it okay to flush trash? And then what can actually go down the drain? In previous years, we've also incorporated fog as a learning topic in schools by creating lava lamps to display that oil and water do not mix. And we've also showed some examples of what recycled oil can create. And then on the right, we have some of our giveaway items. We have a BMP brochure that we give away for residents about fats, oils, and greases. And then um, some things we have incorporated to as well are these grease tins and the fat trapper bags we like to use around the holiday grease roundup. We also have fog funnels, and then we just ordered these grease scrapers. Next slide, please. Another best management practice that we have here in South Lake is the fog manual. So this was originally created in January 2013, but we just did some revisions on it back in 2020. Uh, the document was created to help businesses and industries by providing information about authority, compliance monitoring, type of interceptors, installation, enforcement, and then the sizing of the grease interceptors in South Lake. Next slide, please. So this BMP aligns more with our stormwater program, but it has some importance here with fog. So fog overflows are treated as part of our IDDE program. These can vary from a grease discharge from a grease barrel, such as the one on the right, to a full blown overflow of a manhole shown on the left. From fiscal year 18 until now, South Lake has investigated about 17 related fog discharges. Remediation enforcement varies between circumstances, so a low flow such as the one on the right can call for a stormwater NOV with action required within 10 business days. Or um, the situation on the right, which is a larger impact to environmental and public health, requires 24 hours of remediation and cleanup. The city does provide cleanup support depending on the severity and criticality of the discharge. Um, we have some absorbent socks and absorbent pads for smaller ones, and then we also have a vacuum truck. But more in-depth responses involve cleaning and washing of all surfaces, areas, and drains impacted by any type of grease and reclamation of any water used in the cleaning procedures. So if we have any type of issues, we, since we have a great relationship with code enforcement, um, they're always on our back to help um, you know, cite any establishment who fails to clean up their mess within 24 hours. Next slide, please. These are some statistics that we've generated since our creation of the FOG program in 2017. So we've had over 300 inspections, over 230 samples, 11 total grease trap replacements. We've issued six citations. We've permitted 123 liquid waste haulers and then received over 1500 manifests since October of 2018. Next slide, please. So now I'll dive into repairs and replacements of interceptors around the city. Next slide, please. All right, so with our surface condition of interceptors, we commonly see blocks or rocks used to level the grade ring, and this is not allowed. We do allow bricks, it's just discouraged. 
What we do try to encourage is installing plastic grade rings since they have a greater integrity to hold the ring up. We've also encountered completely unanchored rings as the picture on the right displays. Next slide, please. And then another issue that we've had, which is kind of um, overthought sometimes, you don't really think you're going to have an issue with accessing an interceptor, is um, overgrown vegetation that completely covers um, any type of access. So we've had this issue before. Um, we're still working out the best way to try to communicate with that tenant about this vegetation issue. And then another one we've seen for outdoor interceptors is an entire dumpster completely on top of the interceptor manhole. And then this does occur indoors as well. We've seen small appliances that will sit right on top of any type of grease traps on the floor. Next slide, please. So issues with structure, um, we can see baffle and sidewall corrosion as shown on the picture on the left. Um, they can vary with severity, and so that will kind of also influence the inspection results, whether they're passed, passed with recommendation or fail. We've also seen caps left on inlet and outlet tees, which impedes waste flow. So that's a very easy fix. We'll just have to remove it. But we've also seen completely broken tees laying on the floor of the trap, which will require to be repaired. We've also seen pass through tees installed backwards by plumbers. Next slide, please. And then we have some interceptors that we've seen that are completely beyond repair and that they'll just require a total replacement. So as the issues begin to compound, um, you'll see holes that are created in the baffle walls. You can see in the left picture where the wire's completely showing. Or like the picture on the right of a steel interceptor, you'll see that there are holes in the bottom of the trap and that the baffle walls are completely missing. Next slide, please. So I'll be breaking down each of those pictures into case studies. So this first case study will cover a small indoor trap that had been used for a few food establishments before a cooking lesson business moved in. So from our experience with steel interceptors, they seem to have a life of expectancy of about seven years due to the thin walls that they're made out of. So in early June, we pulled a sample and then we followed up later that month to perform an inspection. And so the inspection photos are on this slide and the trap had failed because of severe corrosion, the missing baffle walls, the holes in the bottom of the trap, and then a missing gasket underneath the lid. Next slide, please. So their sampling results came back exceeding their oil and grease limit of 100 milligram per liter. And then based on the inspection of the trap and these results, we sent them a first notice of violation in July. So this violation included all the steps that the tenant must take to install an entirely new grease interceptor since it was beyond repair. Next slide, please. So the establishment applied for a plumbing permit and part of that process is if they're installing a new interceptor, they have to submit a sizing worksheet that is completed by a licensed engineer. So that's what the picture on the left shows. Um, after review and approval of this worksheet, they may uh, proceed and install that interceptor and then that is inspected by plumbing inspectors over in building inspections. Next slide, please. So after we receive um, verification that the building inspections has gone out and performed an inspection, we follow up and do a field verification just to ensure that everything is installed correctly and that we have it for our own records. So as you can see in these pictures, um, the establishment installed a 70 pound plastic interceptor. Next slide, please. So this second case study it follows a larger outdoor grease interceptor that was servicing a large Italian restaurant. So this initial inspection occurred in September of 2019, and we found a lot of corrosion all over the trap, holes in the top of the baffle wall as seen in the picture on the left, and then the broken pass-through tee. This interceptor also had debris in both chambers that were consisting of cups and silverware. And so based on this inspection, we followed up with a notice of violation. And this one, we did say that repairs are justified and you could instead of doing a total replacement. The next slide, please. 
So shortly after we sent that first notice of violation, this um, establishment had an overflow. One of our parks employees called in and described a grease overflowing into the storm drain near the site. Um, they started overflowing through the manhole lids, as you can kind of see in that middle picture. And they were able to determine it was a blockage in the sewer line on the outlet side. And as we were doing some probing around to see exactly what was causing the blockage, we found um, high density of mop strings that was blocking any type of waste. So you can kind of see that in the picture, bottom picture on the right, the mop strings wrapped around that tool. So once the grease interceptor overflow escalated into an illicit discharge by entering that storm drain, we got code enforcement involved and provided the restaurant 24 hours to remediate the mess. So they called out a liquid waste hauler to pump out the trap and then a plumber to help fix the issue. They also had to power wash the pavement, reclaim the water, and then vacuum any of the type of waste left over. Next slide, please. So after that, we proceeded with a second notice of violation in November to repair the trap. Later in November, we did receive a request for extension to have additional time to replace the trap because they determined it was a 14 year old trap and that any type of repairs was not sufficient for this. And we granted the extension to replace the interceptor, but we did follow up with a sample drawn in November of that year, which came over the limits as well at 305. Next slide, please. So the establishment completed their sizing worksheet and submitted it along with their permit. And so it looks like they needed a 4,000 gallon interceptor to be installed. So with this approved worksheet, they went ahead and installed it and it was inspected by our building inspections division. Next slide, please. And this actually occurred um, in the middle of the pandemic. So um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the replacement fell off our radar. And so in July, we kind of went back and revisited all the places with outstanding obligations to replace or repair their interceptor. So um, I went in and opened the manhole and you could see that the hole above the baffle wall was no longer there. And you could kind of tell that there was construction performed with the shift in pavement on the left. The only thing that was noted in this inspection were that there were plastic bags in the inlet side of the chamber. Next slide, please. All right, so I'll conclude with some struggles and improvements that we have found with our program. So one thing we've struggled with with the pandemic is our continuity of operations. Although most places were closing and employees were work telecommuting, we still had some establishments opening during the height of it. So to continue the permit verifications while aligning with health mandates, we performed digital inspections. This really consisted of an acting manager would send angled pictures to our crew leader right after they had cleaned and we'd kind of verify based on those pictures if they passed or failed. We only did a few of these, um, but it was one strategy that we had to figure out how to work with for the pandemic. Another aspect we've struggled with while operating is working without a work order system. So we do have a database where we track all of our inspections, our samples and our enforcement. Um, we just don't have something to generate a service order based off. And then another thing we've struggled with is shared traps. So they had been grandfathered with an ordinance. Um, so we're still working through those ones that still exist in South Lake, but something else we've come to find out is people still want to try to install them. And so we have to pretty much strategize our communication and explain to tenants why a shared interceptor is um, not allowed anymore. We've also found some improvements along the way. So our town square is the area of South Lake that has the highest density of restaurants and activity. And our wastewater crew has to watch and maintain the infrastructure in this area specifically even more than anything around town. Um, they actually pump it once a month entirely just to make sure that there's no chance of overflow. And since we've implemented a fog program, they've seen a 70% decrease in the waste since we began. Another improvement was expanding our workflow to include building inspections so that we're able to do a verification procedure before we allow any type of business to reoccupy a space. Um, 
And then lastly, we have um, been able to save money on thioguard dosages because we've been able to decrease the amount of grease quantity at our lift stations. A lot of it was coming from that town square area, so um, it's just been very beneficial to have that type of outreach and communication with businesses on why it is important to have BMPs in their kitchens to um, alleviate the grease blockages. Next slide, please. That's all I have for y'all today, and I appreciate everybody's attention, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I have contact information on the site as well if you want to ask me anything after this presentation. Thank y'all so much. Thanks, Madison. Um, I will wait just a little bit. We'll see if we get any um, questions in the chat for you. Also, if you feel like unmuting yourself and asking a question instead of typing it out, that option is available as well. And Madison, I'll tell you that um, we're very excited to see South Lake's welcome packets um, at one of our previous water meetings. It's so nice to be able to have something physical to give out to all of those new businesses. Um, not only just to welcome them, but just so that they know what is happening in South Lake as well. Yeah, and a lot of businesses don't generally know uh, the ordinance and that we do require them to pump out every three months. So it's a really good opportunity just to communicate with them, especially since we can communicate not only fog initiatives, but what's going on stormwater and that will possibly be back to perform a customer service inspection. So it's just, um, it's a very positive way just to interact with our businesses. Awesome. I've got a question here from Casey. How often do you sample? So we sample quarterly. We will generate a list and then um, go out with usually about eight to 12 establishments and then make them aware we'll be by, perform that sample and then analyze the results. And then depending on the limits, if they do come over the limit for an establishment, we'll put them on another list to be sampled again to see if maybe that was a one-off sample or if that we need to start targeting a decreased interval for cleaning, such as 60 days. Uh, where do you take your samples to be analyzed? That's from Alexandra. We use Pace Analytical out of Fort Worth to analyze our samples, so they'll actually come out with us um, and we'll assist them during the day if they need anything, and then they take those samples back to analyze. Okay, looks like I have a message from Tad. Um, Elijah and Madison, my experience with large oil water separators is that an ordinance maintenance interval may not conform with the manufacturer's maintenance instructions. Some early ordinances were focused only on small restaurant type traps and did not recognize that large separators were designed to be serviced based on the amount of captured settled waste and floatable oil. Um, I had a city inspector say the maintenance pump out schedule must adhere to the city ordinance at a 1000 gallon separator. The city later added food establishment to the ordinance language so large industrial facilities with large engineered separators could follow the maintenance procedure for the unit designed. Um, not sure if either of you have something to add to that. So I'm thinking it sounds like a lot of the larger ones still fall into like I don't think we have anything as big as 11,000 gallons for a separator. Um, I can consult with my fog team and see if they've seen anything but a lot of the industries that we have have way smaller interceptors than that and there's we still have them comply with a 90-day cleaning schedule. And then I have a question from Alexandra. Can you share South Lake's uh, business welcome packets with us? Absolutely. I can send an email that has all the PDFs that we include and all the information as well as a picture. And I believe that, um, and I'm sure this information has been updated since you shared with water, I want to say pre-COVID, um, the welcome packet, but I believe that is also posted somewhere on the Wastewater Roundtable website in one of the previous meetings, so I can um, link that as well. Um, Okay, so it is um, 1027. We have a short break right now. 
We will get started. So Ignacio will go next. He is an environmental compliance inspector for the city of Irving. He has been employed with Irving's Water Utilities since 2010, where he started as a water slash sewer repair maintenance worker, where he did everything from repairing water main breaks to the installation of sanitary sewer gravity mains. Since then, Ignacio's work has included televising sewer main lines with the evaluation and coding of Irving's infrastructure before his transition to a lift station and water tower technician, and then eventual move to Irving's uh, Environmental mm -hmm. Compliance Department. In that department, he assisted with maintaining compliance of the stormwater, uh, drinking water, and pretreatment system. And then in 2018, he was promoted to the Environmental Compliance Inspector over Irving's FOG program. So, Ignacio, just give me the go ahead whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Hannah. Um, I'm going to wait to do the questions at the end because my ADD is horrible and uh, we'll get way off track if that's the case. So um, if you want to go ahead, hand to the next slide. Um, so we're going to get into the meat and potatoes about the grease trap inspections itself. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of redundancies, um, you know, when it comes to this, a little bit of overlapping, but it's good information anyways, uh, just to see how we do certain things at different, different cities and stuff. And uh, but we'll uh, we'll push forward there. Um, go ahead, Hannah. So I'm going to talk about a handful of things today. Um, obviously, what is a grease interceptor? Uh, City of Irving requirements. Uh, a little bit of our fog program uh, conducting the inspection. That's going to be the majority of it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about enforcement and some waste haulers. So I got a lot of examples today of things um, that we've seen out in the field. Um, very unique things. Uh, so if there's something y'all haven't seen before, please uh, ask questions. Uh, and um, like I said, I, I've only been doing this for a few years now, and uh, I'm learning as we're going as well. I love going to other cities. I've been to uh, uh, Garland. I've been to um, South Lake. We did a, a little bit at um, Plano as well, too, just kind of checking out what they do and, and vice versa. So definitely learning from other cities is probably some of the best uh, best ways of gaining experience in this industry. Um, go ahead, Hannah. So what is a grease interceptor? Um, I mean, the proper definition of plumbing device that intercepts most grease solids before they enter the waste disposal system. Um, you know, that's pretty obvious what it does. And, um, you know, that's I'm sure everybody by this point now, it's been pounded into your head of what it does. A lot of things, though, uh, probably the majority of what I like to see and what it defines in my mind is something that slows down the flow. Uh, retention time isn't talked about a whole lot when it comes to these interceptors, and that's probably one of the most important parts of a interceptor. So that retention time is what slows everything down, lets everything separate, kind of lets the uh, grease trap do its magic uh, per se. So uh, that's going to be pretty important. I know a lot of different um, techniques, um, uniform plumbing code. Uh, I know different makes and models of grease traps. They use retention time in their calculation to determine uh, sizing requirements. Uh, or appropriate sizing so retention time is very very important when it comes to these things you know you get a high flow uh it stirs things up and it just will not even if it's sized accordingly it just will not be very efficient um go ahead hannah so again grease traps uh here's a just a pretty basic layout of a gravity interceptor um a handful of fixtures that go directly to um a gravity interceptor these are the majority of the ones that we have in irving so in Irving, we probably, if I had to assume, uh, we have about 75 to 80% are gravity interceptors. Uh, the rest are most likely they're, I mean, it's hydromechanical, and then we have a handful of uh, other unique ones that I'll get into later on. Uh, go ahead, Hannah. So again, the two types, you've got the uh, gravity interceptor on the left and a hydromechanical on the right. Um, so most likely, or most cases, the gravity interceptor is going to be located outside. The larger sizes, uh, most of the time, they're made out of concrete. I, I've rarely seen them uh, made in, uh, you know, other materials. I guess the precasting concrete is a little bit easier to make, and it's. Um, uh, lasts a lot longer um, than anything else that I've seen. And uh, the hydromechanical, we have a lot of uh, different makes and models. 
of hydromechanical uh, interceptors. I will say um, I don't like throwing brand names out, but I will just for the sake of training. Um, I did have a um, a shear somebody from shears one of their sales reps come out and explain to me essentially hey sell me a hydromechanical uh, grease trap let's see what it's about and uh, they came and they brought one and we looked at it and uh, he, i mean they from top to bottom explained how much more efficient it is and whenever they were doing that um, we were in the middle of writing rewriting our ordinance like elijah said and um, they touched on the 25% rule and how they're always going to exceed it just because they're so so much more efficient. Um, but just really the process of the baffling and and retention time and just how everything works on these hydromechanical um, grease traps. So it's pretty informative. Um, that's something that's an idea that maybe you guys can do if you're seeing uh, an influx of a certain brand. Uh, reach out to the to them folks. I mean, to them they I mean they love coming out. They have salesmen most of the time that are just you know uh, looking forward to talk to people informing them and just spreading their uh the you know just knowledge on their point i made it very clear to them that i can't tell anybody else because that's one of the most uh frequent asked questions is uh, what would you you know uh, recommend and oh well we can't recommend anything you know but you know at least on our end if they do ask us a specific question you know the more knowledge you know about it i guess the easier it is to answer questions um go ahead so here's a little bit of our requirements uh, so we did change to a 500 gallon across the board uh, prior to this we went off of fixtures so uh, your uh, floor drains three compartment sinks dishwashers cooktops anything like that was considered a uh, fixture the only thing we considered multiple fixtures as one was floor drains and uh, hand sinks so no matter how many of them two you had they were just considered as one uh, but we decided to get away from that. We did the 500 gallon uh, minimum and um, it's just a lot more streamlined for us. So we were putting, I felt we were putting a, um, a cap on that fixture list, you know, getting to four fixtures, even in a really small restaurant goes really, really, really quick. So with doing that, um, you know, you go into a restaurant, they have uh, a floor drain, a three compartment sink, a hand sink, and one cooktop. Well, they've met their their four, uh, you know, the requirement of four fixtures, and they have a 250 gallon grease trap. Well, there's no room to grow for them because anything more than that, they would be essentially out of compliance. Uh, so we figured if we did away with that and just streamlined it to 500 gallons, then that would be uh, a little bit easier on on uh, on us and for them to give them a little bit of room to grow. Um, so that's one of the primary reasons why we did that. Another requirement is that the trap be located on the outside of the establishment. Um, just like anything else, wastewater, sewer, and we've all seen it, it's out of sight, out of mind. You flush the toilets and we don't know where it goes. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, they, you know, they, they don't care. So until there's a problem, then, then it, they get educated and they care about it. So, um, you know, when there is a problem or I say if or when there's a problem with it being outside, um, it's a little bit. Uh, more sanitary, I guess you can say, than it being in the belly of the beast inside of the uh, the kitchen itself. So with that, health department really likes it that we put it in our ordinance for it to be outside because they go into these establishments to do, um, you know, inspections. And yeah, you're walking over grease traps that may have been maintained, may not have, uh, you know, maybe the waste hauler went in and kind of did a sloppy job of dragging hoses inside the establishment. And it's just not 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 the best way we could do things. So that is in our ordinance. Mind you, we do have a lot of hydromechanicals still uh, that are inside establishments, uh, but hopefully at some point we will work away from not having those uh, anymore, um, at least inside the establishment. Um, again, frequency has been talked about a lot this morning. Uh, 90 days is the most we can give to somebody. Uh, that changes. We do provide a variance for folks. And uh, of course, the variance goes through approval. We kind of sit down and look at everything as a whole and determine whether we need to uh, change the variances. And it, and again, like Elijah said, it goes, it can be up to bi-weekly, uh, monthly, 60, 90 days, of course. So uh, that changes um, again with keeping folks in compliance with size requirements that makes my job a little bit easier uh, i am the one inspector for the 1800 grease and grit traps so uh, with folks being in that 90 days really helps me not have to you know chase down manifest every week or every two weeks for some establishments right 
Um, and then we have the 25% rule. So um, I know a lot of folks use um, sludge judges. There's a lot of different measuring tools that they use. And for anybody that doesn't know what the 25% rule is, um, I know Elijah touched on it a little bit. There's a good example there of a sludge judge. You can see the free water and the scum and the sludge. So the sludge at the bottom and the floating um, grease or oil, you know, none of that. With both of those combined, those cannot exceed more than 25% of the entirety of uh, of the um, the tool that we use a sludge judge. Um, I kind of made my own version of a sludge judge just because I, I like to be handy uh, and I'll, I'll show you examples of it later. Uh, but that's a good example of the 25% rule. Uh, next, please. Um, here's our fo FOG program. So again, I'm over the FOG program and, and the majority of it is public outreach, talking to folks, businesses, uh, residents, visitors. Uh, so there's a good picture of me uh, talking to, I think it was a career day a couple years ago, obviously before COVID. Um, and uh, we're doing, uh, we're just reaching out to the kids and I feel like talking to them, you know, uh, from a young age and working their way up, letting them know, hey, this is what you do inside a residential house. And it just, it, it'll carry um, to, you know, their parents may own a restaurant, you know, or just even simple doing the, um, uh, you know, just simple grease mitigation inside the house, which is fantastic. So we like doing that. We do a lot of, again, career days. Uh, we just finished up a summer program for the kids at our recreation centers. So we went out there and showed them pictures of uh, overflows and we brought a vacuum truck and showed them all that fun stuff and uh, showed them, you know, run a nozzle, a, a hose nozzle, on one of the vacuum trucks and how it cuts grease and, you know, what it ends up doing, um, doing to our uh, sanitary sewer. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. And again, just kind of starting young and working their way up. But I mean, at the same time, uh, like I said, last week we did that, the recreation center and one of the ladies, the managers that runs that recreation center, she said, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I was just been pouring my, you know, cooking oil grease down the drain. I'm thinking, oh gosh, don't tell me that. Uh, but luckily she didn't live in Irving, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, it's just common, not, I wouldn't say common knowledge anymore, you know, we're, we're, this is, uh, you know, this is a living document for us. It's changing as it goes. And we just want to educate folks at the end of the day. Um, and at the bottom there, the uh, enforcement, you know, that's really when it comes down to once education isn't working anymore, the enforcement is uh, hitting that pocketbook to make sure that you know, at the end of the day that we're keeping things safe for the residents and uh, businesses and, you know, and even the visitors that want to come in through Irving. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so conducting conducting the inspection, there's a handful of ways where we try to uh, pinpoint our inspections. And these are three main reasons why we do um, uh, the CO process, the certificate of occupancy. So essentially when the um, we got to the inspections department, let them know, hey, if there's a restaurant, if there is um, some type of, um, I, I guess when they fill out their application, you know, they're able to to find out if it's like a restaurant or if it's going to have a grit trap, an auto parts place or uh, auto maintenance, you know, they have uh, grit traps there. Um, then we like to be involved so we they will send us the inspections reports every morning and from there i can uh, go in to do those uh, those co inspections so and the co um usually it's if they're changing hands or if they're opening up a new business if they're doing a large remodel anything like that's going to qualify them to uh, redo a co um the next thing is notice of violations so we will run a compliance report and with that compliance report we will uh we can pinpoint again our um outstanding folks that have not got their grease trap cleaned out and you know it just depends the, you know we'll do 30 day or uh, 60 days 90 days if they're you know their intervals are shorter than that um, but we can go up to six months to a year and the six months to a year has been kind of a common thing for us now with COVID happening, our compliance reports are growing and growing and growing because all these restaurants are closing down. And so we're getting restaurants that haven't been cleaned out in, you know, six months to a year. And once we make it to there, we, well, they've been closed and they were closed due to COVID. But we're seeing a transition now. I guess a lot of investors are coming uh, now and buying these new restaurants and revamping everything. So a lot of COs are starting to come up. I think we've had probably a 
85 percent increase from last year already so far this year so it's it's definitely moving uh moving forward that's for sure uh and the last one is complaints so we get complaints uh concerns from residents we'll get them from uh, inspectors and waste haulers of residents drive buyers as we call them here um you know they'll go by and say hey a lot of water coming out of here or uh, you know, I walked into this establishment and smelled really, really bad. I don't know what's going on. And we'll go in and inspect it and, and find out what's going on. Um, we work really close with other inspectors, building inspectors, fire uh, code, and uh, most uh, is the health inspector. So it is uh, very frequent that we'll get a call from a health inspector saying, hey, we're doing a routine inspection and grease traps overflowing or, hey, some of these sinks here, the, you know, the, the, the uh, floor drains are holding water so, or, you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be. Absolutely. So that'll be uh, something that we can, we really go out and, and take a look at and see what's going on. And um, so that's, that's a big help too. So that phone rings quite often. Sometimes they got a lot of health inspectors. So we go out and verify, you know, what's going on. Um, and the waste haulers, I know uh, Elijah talked a little bit on the waste haulers, sometimes the disgruntled waste haulers, uh, they'll give us a call. But I mean, what's second best inspection for a grease trap is, you know, the, these folks here that uh, look at them and they maintain them every single day. I mean, if anybody knows what to look for, you know, it's the folks that are doing it every day. So I definitely uh, stay in close communications with them. We have about 42 permanent waste haulers right now. And um, again, I, I stay pretty close with them. And especially now that we've transitioned to a manifest, a paper manifest to uh, online, a lot of them folks did not care for the transition. You know, change is scary to some of these folks. And so, um, you know, I've been, I felt like that's really um, closed that bond or really tightened that bond with between the two, helping them, uh, us as a city and them as, you know, um, uh, you know, a waste hauler. So that's really helped us a lot. And uh, yeah, it's it's not far fetched for them to give us a call and say, hey, uh, you should uh, check out this address. You know, uh, they you know, they, I think the floor is missing here and, you know, they've been cleaning it for a year. But, you know, the, the last time they went, they never paid them for. It, so now it's a now it's a deal. So, you know, we'll go out there and do it then. Um, but yeah, they they definitely can be, um, you know, these complaints, I take them very seriously and they really help. And, you know, those, it's always good to have a second set of eyes and ears out there. And, you know, those, th those are sometimes the, the best, the best places. So uh, next one, please. So now we're going to get into conducting the inspection. This is the, again, the meat and potatoes of everything. Um, the Conducting the inspection, I mean, we we have this Linko process. I know Elijah touched on it just a hair, but uh, this is probably one of the best things that we use um, when it comes to that. So um, I like knowing where we're going. Um, again, when I get the inspection reports, I get an address. So when I look at the address, I'm able to determine whether, um, you know, they're in compliance with the uh, city of Irving when it comes to the sizing requirements, pumping frequency, um, and this uh, database allows us to even put in notes, side notes of, hey, it's in the driveway, or hey, it's in the drive through or it's in the flower bed south side of the building. So that that helps us out sometimes because, again, you know, it's convenient to where they put the, the grease trap uh for plumbers not for us uh, accessibility and stuff sometimes that's the last thing on their mind they just wherever it fits they they put them in and go from there um so you know sometimes it can be a little tricky finding them especially if you don't know what you're looking for um you know that's that's something that that definitely helps us um and then from here again they're uh they're living documents so they change they add fixtures they change fixtures we'll add that on here pumping frequency we go out there um you know we can change the pump, pumping frequency on here and then run our compliance reports off of off of that and you can see i know uh they touched on a little bit of the um information that that this database can hold and for any reason that y'all don't have a database or just you know or, or thinking about it a simple spreadsheet will work too i mean a, a simple spreadsheet can work and uh, i mean as you go throughout the months and the years and stuff just add on to it and that's kind of a nice thing too because you can find out the importance of um you know what to look for and you know your side notes or just add take away make it your own um you know because that's that's at the end of the day who's who's uh conducting the inspections so it's definitely um but you know like i said ours ours is pretty user friendly and it, it works great for us uh next one please uh so some of the tools that we use um obviously you've seen a couple things here 
uh, manhole pick. We have uh, different types of um, the uh, manhole extractors, as they call them. There's different ones there. Um, you know, I, I like to use the the pick myself because a lot of them are manholes and those um, those hooks sometimes don't don't do the job and those things get sealed on there with the metal on the metal there. Sometimes they tend to seize. So a little bit of uh, motivation with that hammer sometimes helps for sure. Uh, so I, I, you know, but I carry both for just, you know, just in case any type of a scenario. Um, a grease measurement tool, um, the sludge judge, I keep referring back to that because that's kind of what I've learned how to use it. Uh, you can see the one that I'm holding in my hand does not look like uh, it looks somewhat like one. So I I made one a while back ago, and it's a uh, scheduled 40 um, clear trans it's a transparent PVC. So it's essentially that, but it's eight feet long and it's sturdy. So with the uh, sludge judge and other uh, grease measurement tools, they um, they will connect. They'll have sections of them that put in there, and sometimes I find them to be a little wobbly. The threads kind of get uh, gunked up a little bit and you know sometimes it takes a little bit longer to uh, put them together so we kind of we we made our own here and it's worked out pretty good uh, maybe I should patent it and and uh, retire early but we'll see what happens uh, but so those are good um, they work out pretty good other things uh, screwdriver um, flashlights of course and um, you know your flashlights you want to take a look a lot of them things are pretty dark depending on how deep sizing it gets pretty tough to see what they look like um, and of course your proper PPE you know you always want to have your steel toe boots on uh, glasses safety vest if you're in a high traffic area your gloves unless somebody likes touching grease with their bare hands uh, I'm not one of those anymore uh, but it's uh, it's one of those deals where you know just proper PPE goes a long way um again I, I was i've been doing this for a while now with the vacuum trucks and and all that so i've had a lot of wastewater in places that shouldn't have been and uh so i've, I've learned that proper ppe goes a long way uh next uh, slide please so uh here we are at a establishment i don't know if you can tell what it is uh it rhymes with uh Hack Donald's, so I won't say who it was. But uh, before I got there, I looked at my database and I I knew there was notes already. It says it's a 1500 gallon trap. So I know we're gonna be looking for something pretty, uh, you know, pretty good sized. And also it says it's in uh, parking spots. So just be aware of them being in parking spots, cars being parked on top of them. Uh, so this one's pretty easy to find once we got there. Uh, we looked at them. I, I always look at the manhole ring and lids before I start whacking away at them. I, I don't want to break any. I, I have, uh, not on purpose, um, and, and not because I'm super strong or anything. They just can be in bad shape. So always be mindful of them before you start opening them up. We definitely don't want uh, pieces of cast iron manhole lids inside of the grease trap because that's not fun to walk in there and say hey uh you got a problem with your grease trap you have a 24 inch manhole lid inside of one now so that's never a fun conversation to have with folks um so yeah you know i always take a look at them just make sure they're in pretty good uh shape i will go uh we I have some examples later on in the slides here and show you some um ones that are probably not in as good a shape as these are so again we pop them both open um and uh, and then we'll do the inspection after that so uh, go ahead hannah so this is our main inspection point you got your primary and your secondary Again, um, it's hard to streamline uh, an inspection because they're all made differently. You know, you can't uh, inspect, uh, write an inspection on a car and expect for it to work on all the rest of them because there's just so many makes and models and stuff. So, um, but this is your typical gravity main has one wall and um, one weir, and then you have your your baffles in there. The baffles are pretty caked up in grease. Uh, these folks needed to have their grease trap cleaned out. They were coming up to their 90 days, so. Um, after they had it cleaned out, I, we, we went back and I decided to shorten the frequency on these to 60 days because I felt like it was a little, it was, it exceeded the 25% rule for sure, but I wasn't able to see any of the uh, baffles or the T's or anything like that. So that was, that was a little concerning on my end. Uh, so, but again, things that you look for, uh, you look again for your wall, your weir wall, sometimes, um, you know, those can be uh, falling apart. Um, you can look at sometimes the, the corners, the H, H2S could build up in there and start eating away at the concrete, depending on how septic some things can be, how long they've been sitting there. H2S will literally eat anything. So I've, I've seen a little bit of everything. Uh, so always be mindful of opening up manhole lids a little bit. 
a good common practice for myself is to crack open a manhole uh, lid and just kind of let it air out first. Let it air out for a few minutes and then open it up. Um, we I've seen some pretty uh, unique instances with um, some septic manholes doing wastewater stuff for many years to where you open up a manhole and you, you catch a whiff of H2S and it'll almost knock you down. So you always want to be mindful of that too. So always crack it and just kind of leave it, let it vent out before you pull it all the way open. Uh, but again, looking at this, there's a, nothing really wrong. The ring and lids looks pretty good. Besides it being dirty, we looked at um, you know inside the corners and all that just to make sure that nothing was corroded or there wasn't any uh, uh, any PVC you know pipe floating or anything like that. Um, you know, look for stuff where that's you know it's out of the ordinary. You know, look at uh, you know, plastic bags or you know things that shouldn't belong there. Uh, there's always telltale signs of things are put in incorrectly. Um, you know, from looking at the grease trap, you know, you'll see plastic lids. I've seen all types of stuff inside these grease traps, and obviously nothing but food particles. Excuse me, uh, should be in this. Um, the go to the next slide, please. So with this one, again, you can see the 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 measuring tool that I've used. And with it being one piece, I'm able to fill in the corner. So that's what I'm doing. Before I measure the grease, I'm I'm poking at the corners, kind of touching the wall to make sure that, you know, it seems pretty sturdy, cleaning out any of the baffles. And with it being one piece, it's again, it's very, very sturdy. So I'm able to do that. Um, so that's 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 kind of nice. So that's what I'm doing there. I'm I'm poking the corners, kind of filling the concrete around, seeing if there's anything that feels unordinary or, you know, I found basketballs and stuff inside of these things before. So it's, it's you know, you're never surprised at what you feel. So you kind of feel the bottom of it. And depending on how clean it is, you know, you could really, um, uh, you know, conduct a really thorough inspection uh, of these grease traps. Uh, next one, please. So here is a good example of our 25% rule. Um, so once I, I take uh, my homemade measuring device here, uh, you're able to tell. I know the pictures are a little hard to tell. Um, they did exceed the 25% rule. You can see on the second picture on the right hand side where um, my fingers pointed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see where it ends there and they definitely exceeded exceeded it. So the um the duct tape that i have there is in one foot increments so you got one two three almost four feet there so that tells you how deep uh, a grease trap is and those one foot increments besides it helping us with the 25 percent rule it'll tell us the um the depth of a grease trap as well so if you go to a location and uh, you don't know what size the grease trap is you know you can do your calculation by you know depth you know, length times width and all that fun stuff, and it'll give you, um, you know, a good sizing, at least a good area to be in uh, to to know the sizing of a grease trap there. So, um, but yeah, so far this has been working pretty good for us. Uh, I think I'm going to make one just a hair longer, um, but we'll 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 see at some point. Um, but yeah, it was just you know, it's just been a good tool for us so far. So we'll continue to use it until we can either come up with something different or. Uh, you know, maybe we can find a manufacturer or somebody that uh, comes up with uh, something more innovative because this is a growing market. You know, this was not so much a big to topic, you know, 20 years ago, and now it's just all over the place. So, you know, comes the necessity of things and, you know, comes development. So that's usually how that works. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, so again, after looking at it, you know, this one didn't have any big issues uh so this is usually a, an easier inspection so um we always want to make sure that we clean put back stuff I, you know i've seen different inspectors do different things when it comes to cleaning their sludge judges out uh where we just drain everything back into the manhole which is pretty common uh that's you know that's usually pretty common practice and um, wipes or what have you we have a really nice um car washing facility so usually at the end of the day i'll run by that car wash and uh, we make sure that we get any residual off i'll and uh because those sludge judges usually don't smell very good after a couple of days of non-cleaning especially in the heat it smells fantastic so the power wash goes a long way for us to make sure that that stays pretty clean uh that's probably the best way that we keep it clean uh and then probably the most important thing as well is to leave it 
uh, either the same way or in better conditions than when you got there. Uh, so, you know, make sure that those lids are put on there correctly. Make sure they're sealing like they're supposed to. Um, you know, if there's any corrective measures that you see right off the bat, make sure to let somebody know uh, to get that um, corrected. So I always I always make sure, especially ones in the drive through or ones that are, um, you know, I've read articles where, you know, kids have fell into them because, you know, forgot to clean a lid or something. So always double check your work and make sure that, uh, you know, the lids are placed on there because uh, nobody wants to fall into one of those things or we don't want a car halfway falling into one. So, again, if you see a broken lid or one that could potentially break, make sure you make a note of it and let, the, let these folks know. Uh, sometimes these lids are not meant to be traffic rated as much. You know, they're they can take a four or five thousand pound car, but not a twenty thousand pound eighteen wheeler that's delivering food every day. You know, so just be mindful of that as well. Uh, go ahead, Anna. Uh, so I did talk about some of the common problems that we do find, um, but these are the ones that I've I've seen um, myself. Uh, you got rusted rusted housings. So some of the housings. A lot of them uh, back in the day, you know, they used metal and metal's organic. It's going to break down. Uh, you know, they use different coatings or different paints or whatever to try to seal them. But it only works uh, so far. Okay. It only works uh, short. I don't know if I'm getting feedback or if somebody's not muted. So, OK, never mind. Uh, thank you. Um, so, you know, that's one thing to look at. And I know Elijah had a couple pictures of uh, some of the metal ones that were just deteriorating. And that's just, you know, that's just something that we see quite often. But luckily, we're slowly but surely changing them to newer ones. So that's that's good. Uh, broken and missing inlet tees. So that's a big thing there. Are a lot of folks uh, with the older traps, they will be cast iron and the cast iron breaks, you know, so they have a hard time replacing those tees with um, with PVC, uh, which is what they use now to cast iron. So there's different ways of doing it now, but those are pretty common. Um, a lot of the times it's uh, waste haulers, you know, they're throwing their hose in there and cleaning them out and sometimes they'll knock one loose and after doing that three four five times you know they'll they'll finally break i mean it's just like anything else uh so you always want to be mindful of them i don't know how many times i've seen i'd open up a manhole lid and the t is just floating on top of the grease so obviously that's not doing its job if it's if it's doing that um and we you know we will uh we'll let the the establishment know say hey look you know y'all you know your grease trap needs a little bit of repairs and stuff and uh, you know, that's going to be something that needs to be taken care of pretty quickly uh, just so, you know, they don't have issues. We don't have issues. And I mean, it's like having a car with a flat tire. You know, it's still a car, but it's not going to get you very far, you know, in that condition. So you want to make sure that it's working at, at the efficiency that it was made for. Um, so the clog tees as well, sometimes um, they don't get cleaned. They, you know, everything is just they'll suck down the uh, the the two sides of the manholes and those don't really get any attention and uh those are the primary sources of i mean that's the first thing that the sewer and uh grease everything gets flushed down it hits so those, those will have a lot of um a lot of buildup sometimes so you want to make sure that those aren't um you know those aren't damaged again the baffle wall the weirs uh make sure those don't have any cracks in them if, you think um they are i mean it'd be a good idea to schedule the waste hauler say hey when are y'all going to come out there next i'd like to be out there and and look at it but uh sometimes i've seen them and i got pictures of some different weirs and stuff that are uh broken or damaged you know falling apart or what have you and uh, we'll take a look at those later uh incorrect tie-ins i've seen this a handful of times too um put them in backwards uh tying bathrooms to them so Obviously, some folks know that you can't tie in bathrooms, uh, but we've seen it before too. Uh, they have different things that shouldn't be tied in uh, or tied in too close. For instance, uh, a dishwasher, I've seen dishwashers tied in, I mean, within like two or three feet of uh, grease, uh, grease traps. And I mean, that's just hot, hot liquid going right down in there and it's going to solidify what's there. Again, it throws that retention time out of the water. It doesn't let it separate, uh, and it's not able to do its job if that's the case. So always take a look to see if it's tied in or anything is out of uh, the norm. We use dye a lot here, and uh, dye really goes a long way when it comes to that. Um, so, you know, run some dye down into a, a, a toilet or a sink that we don't know um, and go from there. We have a handful of establishments sometimes where – They'll do some uh, plumbing work. They won't pull a permit. So it's just kind of he said, she said, well, I think my plumber tied this sink in, but I'm not too sure. 
And, uh, you know, that's just one way of finding out for sure is by the die. So we use that a lot. Uh, and then the clean out caps, clean out caps are pretty important. Sometimes they they get uh, broken. Uh, unfortunately, with the grease straps, uh, they're placed in parking lots, a lot of traffic. So these um, these clean out, clean, you know, clean out caps aren't, um, you know, they get broken or what have you. And uh, that causes a lot of problems. Sometimes it's not even the grease. It's more of the trash and brush and I and I from the rain, um, you know, different things that can get down in there. And I don't know how many times I've been to SSOs because of, you know, from for grease traps and it's, uh, you know, oh, yeah, there was a bunch of trash and paper bags and leaves and stuff in there. And obviously the grease traps aren't meant to to hold that those type of solids. So it's going to create issues. So anything upstream and downstream, you know, that's you want to protect that as much as you can. Um, go ahead, Hannah. So here's some examples. Um, I uh, so we'll start with the one on the left. So that was a grease trap that was found. Um, it was in our database, but it showed that it was not being used. And uh, we looked all over the place for it, just for whatever reason, opened up a vault that was a little bit further down. And sure enough, there was a grease trap in there. And obviously, it had not been serviced in probably forever. Uh, so we found out, um, you know, what was going on with it. And uh, obviously, the person that wanted to um, occupy that building, they're able to find where the plumbing leads to. So uh, I obviously know why they put it where they put it. It was... Uh, shopping center that's really close together they're they're just really you know back to back to back to back so putting a grease trap in certain places can be tough and again that goes back to like i said it's the convenience of the plumber not more of the the inspector right so um that one was able to um they were able to revamp that one make that one brand new uh and not that one particular that one all that was ripped out they put a brand new one in right so um that's that's pretty cool um that's a pretty cool one that we found the one on the right um there was no lid or anything to that one that just opened to the elements and you can see what happens again with the organic matter that you know that happens i mean this is just uh you know chemical reaction that's happening here just rainwater it just holding what you know holding sewer rainwater and it just it'll break down so you can see this has no baffles on each side it's a super small trap it's probably a if i had to guess maybe a 10 20 gallon uh, uh, grease trap and no baffles so there's there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh, boxes not being checked to meet our requirements when it comes to something like that. So, uh, and again, that just shows you um, just the time of, you know, what was placed 20 years ago to compared to now. So the d technology and everything has definitely changed since then. And again, you can see kind of where my foot is at. There's a clean out there with no lid and it's full of leaves. I mean, it's completely caked full of leaves. So no matter if that grease trap was in good working order, they're probably going to have more issues because of the I and I uh, and the trash buildup inside the clean outs there. Uh, next one, please. Uh, going back to the lids. So the ones on the left here, those are in pretty bad shape. Um, all that water that you see there wasn't from an overflow it was from uh rain so it had rain and unfortunately the roof gutters were right in front of them so anytime it would rain heavy uh all the leaves and trash and brush would just go right into that grease trap and completely just i mean uh, i mean it was just an accident waiting to happen or an overflow waiting to happen more than anything else so you can see from one end how corroded they are um and um we had talked to the waste hauler and says yeah we were just there not too long ago and those lids look like they haven't been opened in a really long time so uh we made sure to have them put brand new lids on there uh so it wouldn't cause any more issues um and then on the right hand side we have the total opposite this is a brand new grease trap brand new grease trap i think it was a 2000 gallon grease trap that was put in and when they relayed all the concrete um over everything you can see that it was um concreted over and uh and it's again one of those things where they said yeah we just we just opened uh we just serviced the grease trap you know a month or two ago and i asked the guy to come out and show me how they opened that manhole lid because i was wanting to learn something new of how you open up a manhole lid it's completely covered in concrete uh so uh wasn't able to open it obviously so it's just one of those deals where even the new ones you got to look over and that's part of that co process i said uh we get to a lot of new establishments with new grease straps and uh, we want to make sure that those lids are accessible i mean the day that they open um you know we just we, we always want to be um you know uh, just keep it in, in our mind that they have to be accessible at all times because 
Uh, unfortunately, whenever it's an emergency and we need to get to them, that's whenever they're covered in concrete, we find out, or, you know, it's in a flower bed and they're completely corroded to where they're not able to open them or, or you know, whatever the instance is. So we want to always make sure that those ring and lids uh, are accessible and in good working order. Uh, next one, Hannah. Uh, so here's two that are uh, in fantastic shape. Uh, the one on the left was a uh, torteria place. Uh, they make tortillas and um, they have uh, garbage bags. They have different caps from the manufacturing process of the uh, tortillas, right? And uh, obviously that's, the, that's just, again, goes back to BMPs going back inside and making sure that they have strainers on all the drains. And, and of course we walked inside and uh, they had a bunch of um, floor drains, grates that had really big openings. And you could just see the, the, you know, the caps and lids and stuff that were going into them. There was just no, no, no type of, uh, there was just no way of, of capturing any of that stuff. So there was secondary containment uh, that they added to it to help with that. Um, but again, besides the grease trap, obviously being completely full, um, you had different materials in there that that did not belong um, inside of the uh, inside of that grease trap. Uh, the one on the right here, that's a weird. That's one of the walls I was telling you about that you can tell sometimes that the shape it's in. So about right in the middle where the darkest point is at, um, you can see that the grease is just flowing right in between. So that wall is completely gone, completely missing. So that weir is doing nothing. I mean, at this point, the once a heavy flow comes in, the grease is going from one chamber to the next with nothing there to stop it. So again, the retention time gets thrown out the window. Uh, this doesn't have baffles as well. So uh, this is really just a big hole in the ground for all the grease to, to hang out until it goes into our sanitary sewer. So, um, you know, these are ones that we definitely want to uh, to find and, and have them replaced. Uh, so at this point, you know, they they got the, they were able to find this one and, and get it replaced and, and, and done. So this is a good find here for us. And this was actually one by a waste hauler. He says, yeah, I've been cleaning it for years and I've been noticing that that wall is just kind of, you know, deter deteriorating little by little by little. So it's at this point now it's not doing its job anymore. So again, you know, the eyes and ears that we have out here uh, go a long way. So, you know, definitely, um, you know, make make note to these folks to say, hey, you know, if y'all find anything, let us know. Uh, we'll, we'll be glad to go and ch check them out. So uh, next one, please. Uh, so y'all can obviously see what y'all can see what's wrong with this one. Uh, so for one, uh, water's not supposed to be coming out of the grease trap, right? So we got called for an overflow. We took a look at it and stuff. And again, that database goes a long way. So that is a first. It's a pawn shop, uh, and so obviously you think pawn shop. Well, why do they have a grease trap, right? And so. Uh, I grew up in Irving. I was born and raised in Irving. So fortunately for me, I, I kind of knew what some of the businesses were prior to what they are, uh, you know, in today, today's age, right? So I knew a long time ago that this was an Arby's. And uh, we looked in the database and fortunately inside the database, they said, hey, this is an Arby's and now it's a pawn shop, right? And so um, for whatever reason, they redid some plumbing probably 10, 15 years ago, and they tied into the bathrooms. So the bathrooms for a, a pawn shop was going to there. It was just a single bathroom. You got maybe a employee, maybe two at some, you know, at some points of the day. And it took a while and it finally filled up. So once it filled up, that's how we were able to tell. So for the obvious reasons that grease traps are not able to take, uh, you know, in, influx from a bathroom, toilet paper, any type of solids or anything like that, that's not what they're designed to do. So it, it will obviously overflow. So just like this one. So this was kind of unique. Uh, this was the first one that I've seen that was tied in incorrectly. Uh, they will they were able to uh, put in a plan review, have a plumber come out and they tied it in correctly uh, after the point after that point. So. Uh, it worked out for the best, but it's just a unique find. You know, we're thinking, you know, why why do these folks have a grease trap? But mind you, a lot of these buildings, and I know this is the case in everyone's city, are a lot older than um, than you know we know, right? So they, you know, this building here is about 50 years old. So who's to say, you know, the grease trap is probably 25 years old, right? So um, uh, that's a good find. Uh, the next one, please. 
Uh, here's two pretty unique grease traps that I found. Um, one, not so much unique. I know a lot of cities do have them. We have a handful of them and literally a handful. There's probably five or six of these big dippers. So they did talk about the automated uh, grease removal. So the heating element heats everything up. A skimmer runs across the top of it and then it goes into a, uh, a container that gets uh, disposed of daily or whenever they remember. Uh, I don't really care too much for these. Um, more mechanics. Uh, the more parts that could break uh, in my book, um, and also we're leaving the um, the preventative maintenance to the restaurant, the establishment. So it's up to them to make sure that they have their uh, best management practices in line and to prioritize that because you know it shows it on our database, but there is not a, a pumping frequency for this. It's it's kind of when they fill up or when they want to get it cleaned out. So there's no way that I that we can require them to clean it out daily. Uh, I mean that that would just be um, uh, hard to keep up with. You know, going day to day, sending compliance letters saying, hey, make sure you clean out. You know, your your big dipper, right? So don't really care for them too much. Uh, we mostly found those at pizza places, pizza parlors, and stuff, but. Uh, those have changed hands quite a bit by now. So luckily I was able to snag a pick uh, back in 2019 um, of one. So again, there's probably about five or six now in the, you know, in our city. So uh, those are going to be relics one day, at least for us. Um, so again, um, that's pretty cool. The second one was something that was um, pretty neat that I had never seen before either. Uh, this was at a hospital that um, they were redoing the kitchen. So they found mold inside of the hospital kitchen. And so they closed the kitchen down completely to remove mold. Um, so this 18-wheeler, uh, this trailer that's here is actually a converted commercial kitchen. So this was obviously very temporary, and this is the grease trap that they use. So this company goes all over the nation, and this is what they do. So they provide temporary, um, you know, kitchens for places, you know, for instances like this. So um, they have these three containers that the grease trap gets uh, gets cleaned out to, um, or dumps into rather. And uh, we did a temporary frequency of every, you know, three weeks, three to four weeks, go out there and make sure that it gets maintained. And, uh, but I think it was three weeks, it was keeping it pretty maintained and uh, making sure there wasn't any spillage there. Our only concern with this, um, well, there was two for me that I found right off the bat is, uh, drivers, this is in a parking lot. I was really hoping that no one was going to back into this, break some plumbing, and then find out the next day that it's been draining all night. Because again, it's at a hospital. They're making three meals a day uh, for all the folks that are there. That's a lot of meals. That's a lot of water that's running through there. Um, and unfortunately for us, that probably about 50 yards away is a tributary that we have, and it's an open creek. So we we didn't want to, uh, you know, of course it overflows, a cap breaks or what, it, you know, what have you. It will, um, you know, it'll go right into that creek. So we also want to be mindful of our stormwater system as well, our MS4 to protect that um, from any type of discharge. So I don't have a picture of it, but what we ended up doing is putting a fitting on the other side. Well, we did, and we had them do it, and we found a uh, private manhole that they fell to back there, and so we ran a hose to that manhole, and they were able to discharge everything. You know, once the grease trap did its magic, discharge that back into the sanitary sewer. So just in case one of those malfunctioned or, you know, again, a car hit, just anything like that, we just ha added a layer of protection. So this is something unique. I've never seen it before, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, pretty cool for them. So uh, next one, please. Uh, so again, we're going to talk about enforcement just a little bit. Um, this is uh, part of it. So again, this is last case scenario, or uh, sometimes it's first case, you know, just depending on the instance. Uh, so we can hold a certificate of occupancy inspection. So now that we're a part of that, we can hold an establishment from opening up, which is pretty substantial, uh, right? Um, for the most part for us, you know, it's, we don't like to do it, but at the end of the day, we got to protect our, you know, our infrastructure. So, uh, if I go to an establishment and, um, they have a grease trap that is just not in good working, it's not in, not in a uh, good working order, then I can hold it. And for instance, if it's a restaurant and you have a building inspector, fire marshal, um, the health inspector and myself go out there and without having the approval of those inspectors, um, you cannot, you cannot operate without a CO. So we have done that. And that's, that's been a really helpful tool. If, uh, if, any of the sister cities around here don't have any type of uh, 
um, inspections or, you know, can be a part of the CO process, I definitely recommend it because that's that really puts a hold on things and that really uh, prioritizes, um, you know, our, our wastewater system. So we've done it and uh, it's worked out for the best for us. So that's one good enforcement option that uh, can be provided. Uh, the next is a notice of violation. So this is an example of a notice of violation. Mr. John Smith over here did not get his grease trap cleaned out in a timely manner. So we uh, we wrote him a notice of violation and our on our notice of violations, we revised them not too long ago and we added the uh, maintenance, uh, maintaining the grease trap interceptor. So you can see the checkbox there. I know it's a little hard to read. And on the corrective measures we uh, we put on here, uh, need to have the interceptor serviced by an approved waste hauler within 48 hours um, of today, of course. So the, the time and date, that's always very important to put on there. And then uh, to avoid any more enforcement actions, we are um, officers of the court, so we can give a ticket out if we feel it's necessary. Uh, 48 hours is pretty streamlined. That's usually what we like to go by. And again, we give these folks, uh, I mean, again, it's it's education before enforcement. And so we give them every tool. I carry a list of the waste haulers um, with with me. So anytime I do any type of inspections or uh, anything like that, you know, well, give me a list. I mean, you know, who, who do you, you know, who do you guys uh, recommend, which we can't give recommendations, but we can at least give them the tool of, hey, pick up the phone. Here's uh, in alphabetical order, 42 people that you could use, call one of them. And I always tell folks, you know, um, when I do my enforcement letters, they say, well, they never showed up, so I don't know what to tell you. And I said, well, I gave you another 41 options to give. So don't ever let the waste hauler get you in trouble because at the end of the day, it's your trap and it's your responsibility. So if they cannot get there in a timely manner, then uh, find somebody else. You know, uh, that's why we provide that list. You know, use somebody else that'll uh, come out and do this for you. Um, and so from the notice of violations, uh, it'll, you know, it can always, it'll transition or increase to a citation. Uh, so we can always issue citations if we deem necessary. Um, pumping frequency, um, you know, with enforcement that, you know, we can always change your pumping frequency with that as well. A big one now that we have been doing is shutting off the utility so if we go to um, a restaurant and, you know, they're overflowing and there's no in inside there, they, oh, I can't get a hold of a plumber. Uh, my corporate's not answering the phone. We'll just shut the water off. Just shut it off. And that right there will stop an overflow because uh, at the end of the day, you know, we have to protect our environment. So, uh, you know, that's one way of doing it. Uh, it's not the, the best way uh, to do things sometimes, but it is the the most efficient way just we have tools, uh, like Elijah said, we have vacuum trucks that will go out there. But again, that is City of Irving Cruise. That is uh, taxpayer money that's going out there and using a $400,000 machine to vacuum somebody just because you can't find a plumber it doesn't seem, um, you know, just efficient for both ends of us. So, you know, we will definitely do uh, our due diligence and we will go out of our way to help our residents and businesses and stuff. But at some point, you know, we just uh, we can't just be there 24 hours a day to do this uh, for them. Uh, so with uh, shutting the utility off, that's that's something that was that's in our ordinance now that we're able to do. Um, and mind you, shutting the utility off, not only um, are they won't have water, well, now they can't have a working food permit because they ha cannot wash their hands. They have no water. So again, not only will they not have water, now they're going to have their um, food permit revoked. And that's another fine. That's another fee uh, that you know can be attributed to uh, an overflow. So again, sometimes out of sight, out of mind, you hit that pocketbook and it changes everything and puts things in perspective for them and prioritizes it for sure. Um, sample effluent. So um, that happens. I know Elijah talked a little bit about pretreatment and, you know, oil and grease and staying within our uh, local parameters and stuff. That's why we now add a sample well after everything. So we're able to, to sample um, different, um, you know, traps or grit traps or um, you know, anything like that, we're, we're giving ourselves, uh, you know, a vantage point here to, to make sure that we're able to do our job as well, make it easier for us, um, as well as for them as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our waste haulers, um, so I do uh, keep them in compliance as well. If they want to be a part of the city of Irving, uh, there's a handful of things that we do require. Of course, a waste hauler application. We have our own application that we we do, um, you know, a payment of 150 for 
Um, the first truck, anything after that within that year is 100. So again, we have about 42, 43, it kind of bounces back and forth of uh, um, approved waste haulers right now. And, um, you know, I reach out to them and let them know, hey, you know, your permits are coming up, make sure you get them done. Uh, but I won't beg and plead them. If they want to do work in the city of Irving, then by all means, they will prioritize to make sure that they're in compliance with us. Uh, so, we'll, you know, we're we're a helping hand, we're a tool, but we're only as good as, um, you know, as much as they want to take advantage of, um, you know. So we, um, we definitely make sure that um, we tell them, you know, that there are certain things that we ask of them, you know, uh, when it comes to getting um, paperwork done right or, you know, uh, cleaning out grease traps, you know, we're obviously opposed to just don't don't skim the top of it make sure that it's cleaned all the way to the bottom make sure you power wash any of the baffles the t's you know the weirs and stuff make sure that all those are taken care of they're they're power washed and i mean we want this thing looking you know brand new and working as efficient as soon as you guys leave um you know sometimes uh you know they they don't and it's just because of time or what have you but uh it's nothing for us to hide in some bushes and uh you know take a peek at what these waste haulers are doing and we've done it. Um, we've had some SSOs before because of grease traps overflowing and we found the time and date of when a waste hauler was there. Uh, they went, we watched them conduct a service without them knowing that we were there. It was probably about four or five in the morning and uh, we they dropped off a manifest. We got there and took a picture of the manifest, opened up the grease trap and it was still pretty dirty and full. So obviously they weren't doing their job and we'll kick them off the list. It's very simple. You know, we ask of them certain things and if they don't want to provide that service or don't seem deemable, then, you know, it's very simple. They don't have to do work in Irving. Um, so again, a couple things. Uh, the TCEQ registration, the sludge form that they uh, are provided from the TCEQ, proof of insurance, driver's license, um, you know, and this is also good um, for the generators itself. You know, I give them the list and to them, they look, you know, they've asked what's so special about this list. Why can't I find somebody, uh, you know, and I tell them we essentially do the legwork for you. We make sure that these folks are in compliance, not only with us, but with the state. You know, we make sure that these folks are doing um doing you know what we deem necessary to make sure that this service is going to be provided um you know so it's nice that you know we tell them we check for their insurance we check for their driver's license you know we make sure that they're a legitimate company before we you know ask you guys to use some somebody from them so that's always nice it's very reassuring to the generators saying oh, okay well this is a list these guys have already done their due diligence so i know um, and I always preach to these people because, uh, you know, it's just the next question is, well, who do I go to? You know, who who's the best company here? And I tell folks, look, you know, everyone has the rules and regulations. They're all the same. I tell them that the quality of work is going to be the same. The only difference is going to be a price and that I cannot help. I cannot uh, determine the price of what they charge. Because, um, again, we have some of the biggest companies in North Texas. They have 30, 40 trucks. And then we have some mom and pops. They have just a single truck. It's an owner operator. And, uh, you know, they're just trying to make it. So, uh, you know, I can't determine prices with that just because that's just not feasible for us. But again, uh, quality of work should be the same. You know, I expect them to do the, the same work from, you know, one end to the other. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's the online entry that we talked about just a little bit. So this is the manifest essentially of what we ask for. So um, this is new uh, to us, of course, and to them. I know a handful of waste haulers that do a lot of the sister cities around here. They have done it before, and uh, this is nothing new. So this is the same information that the uh, that we asked for prior to on paper, just electronically, and uh, it worked out very, very well. It's worked out very, very well for us. Uh, all of our waste haulers, we didn't lose any because of this. You know, a lot of them are are super happy. They don't have to buy trip ticket books anymore, and that uh, they can do this online. Um, but uh, as much as they like it, you know, it was really something that we wanted for us. Again, that goes back to the one inspector. Uh, so this is uh, you, you can imagine the the one inspector and a staff assistant having to put in all these manifests, these paper manifests and put in. So it, it essentially will pay for itself very, very, very quickly. Um, but probably the nicest thing about this is the 24 hours we give them to input this this data. So prior to um, we were giving them 10 business days. That was in our ordinance to 
uh, you know, give us the paperwork. And depending on the mail, you know, it would be a while before we would get them. And then they would sit on a desk before we were able, able to input them all. So it was hard to run a compliant and up-to-date compliance report because it could be two or three weeks before we were actually able to input these manifests in. So now uh, these update within 24 hours. So if they do the service that day, the, as long as they input the data the next day, uh, we should have an up-to-date compliance report. So if I want to run a compliance report for people that are out of date in a week, then I can do that. And I know that is up-to-date. So they can't tell me, oh, I just got it done last week. Well, no, you haven't because we either haven't gotten the report or it wasn't done. Uh, so that's always nice because that's what we heard. We, we would send out these notice of violations like, oh, I just got it done, you know, two weeks ago. Well, we sent out this paper and essentially scared them for nothing because uh, they had already gotten it done, right? So with this now, it's very, very streamlined um, and it's really helped us a lot. Um, so pinpointing the grease trap inspections, I know it's kind of hard to tell, but on the second body of that form, there's two little check boxes there. And um, one says, you know, there's a grease trap and get a working condition. The other one is there critical, uh, you know, is there, you know, does it need to be looked at pretty quickly, pretty quickly. So if they check off any of those two boxes, it sends me an email automatically and it says, hey, um, this waste hauler said that there's, you know, one of these check, one of these boxes were checked. So it, then I know there's a critical problem. There's, there's an issue here. So that prioritizes my inspections to say, okay. Uh, you know, again, eyes and ears out there. These folks are looking at the trap. They, they, they are, they are essentially the boots on the ground. And so, if they see a problem, then most likely there is a problem. So we will go out there, and from there we can, um, you know, we we can determine, you know, how bad the issue is, and then bring it to light to anybody else. And nine out of ten times, the waste hauler's probably gone in there, said, "Hey, I cleaned out your, you know, your grease trap. Here's your trip ticket. Here's your receipt. Uh, also, there's some issues there. You, you may want to take a look at." And oh, okay, yeah. And then you know, we're we're back to square one uh, most of the time. So at least with this, we can go out there and say, "Hey, you know." Uh, waste haulers gone out there. They said there's a problem. I have inspected it now. Now I know there's a problem. You know, now we need to get it fixed. Uh, so that's really nice. And that's something that Linko was able to do for us. And that really helps uh, pinpoint and prioritize our inspections. Um, another cool feature of this is uh, pictures, provided pictures. So there's, you can, um, you can add attachments on there. And at some point later on in life, I think we're going to have them take pictures. The waste haulers, once they're done, snap a picture of what the grease trap looks like um, whenever it is uh, completed. And so there, essentially, we can conduct an inspection. I mean, a, a picture, you know, uh, tells them, you know, a million words. So that's that's nice. You be able to look at this picture and say, okay, yeah, the grease trap does look pretty good. You know, maybe I can prioritize that a little bit, you know, further down the list here uh, because we're able to see physical, you know, visual evidence of what the grease trap looks like. So that's super cool. Um, a lot of these tools here is definitely room for us to grow and that's what we wanted. So uh, with the attachments and other things like that, other tools at some point, it's gonna be pretty, pretty cool. Um, you know, it's gonna be a, a lot more helpful for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, now we're gonna get to the waste haulers. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me for a sec. So I wanna thank Trimble. They were, they were able to come out and, and do a service for us here in uh, Las Colinas. Um, and this is a, a new location, and this is a really good example of, um, you know, what we expect of them and, and you know, just professionalism as a whole here. These folks are very, very top notch. Uh, I'm not a sales rep for them, so <laughs> they're just they're just top notch folks. Um, I know at our last Grease Interceptor uh, training a few years back, uh, I think Trimble was one of the guys that went out there. I think it was Ronnie. Ronnie Trimble's the one. Uh, that went out there. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to thank him uh, the day that we did the inspection. Uh, I was told that he went to the hospital, so hopefully he's doing better. Um, but yeah, he was able to to provide the, uh, this service for us, which was really, really helpful. Um, so this is your typical servicing. A uh, truck pulls up, you know, they get out and they park where they seem, you know, deem necessary. Fortunately for us, this is out of the way. It's not in, it's in a parking lot, but it's not where cars will be parked on top of. Uh, it's not on a drive through and this is something that's being done in the middle of the day, which is pretty cool. So they get there. The uh, first thing they do, obviously, is open up the manhole lids. Uh, go ahead, Hannah. And this is the first thing you'll see. They'll connect their hose, and uh, you can take a look at what the grease trap looks like prior to. So uh, this one, obviously, the ring and lids look really good. Uh, this is a newer setup. This is probably less than five years old, if I had to assume. Um, but this is essentially what they use. This is their hose with a... Uh, 
you know, three, four inch piece of PVC that they use to uh, to vacuum everything. Um, and then from here, you know, they'll they'll inspect everything. They'll kind of see if, you know, if anything is, you know, needs to be brought up to their attention. And again, if they do see that, they don't have to make a phone call. When they type in the manifest, they're in the parking lot when they're done. All they have to do is uh, click on one of the critical um, boxes and say, hey, I see a problem. So that's one less thing that they don't have to go back to, you know, their yard or once they dump to say, oh man, I forgot to call the, you know, these people or forgot to tell them that there's a problem. Now it's just very streamlined. They can just do it without, uh, with less interaction sometimes uh, helps with them. Right. So this is essentially what it looks like when they start vacuuming um, the grease trap down. Uh, go ahead, go to the next one, please. Uh, he brought the power washer out and you can see uh, the ring and lid, every the um, I, I guess the riser that's there. They power wash the riser that going down the uh, baffle, the the T that's there. Uh, you can see that the T has now been pretty cleaned. Uh, it's a lot cleaner than what it was, and just breaking all the grease down from the walls. And you can see it's starting to get uh, foamy and it's starting to really, really mix everything up. You know, everything. Uh, the more water, the pressure water liquefies everything. It's a little bit easier on the pumps and motors. Uh, on the pickup trucks, so that's that's why they do that. But essentially, just to power wash everything down. So uh, it looks really good so far. That's that's essentially what uh, what ends up looking like once they're in the middle of uh, getting one cleaned out. Uh, next one, please. This is finishing up here. Uh, you can see he's at the very very bottom. Now you can really see that T there, and the T's in really good shape. Uh, now it's been cleaned. You can see the walls. The walls have no grease buildup on the. You can see kind of maybe three walls in that picture, or two to three walls there. But um, I assure you that all three were were clean. They all look like the one that you can see pretty well. Uh, and some folks they go above and beyond. Um, like the guys here from Trimble, they uh, are cleaning the manhole rings and lids. Uh, and anything around it, you know, any type of buildup that they see, you know, they, he says, well, I clean the lids and the rings just to make sure that they, uh, you know, they don't, they don't start to, you know, get buildup in between them and be hard to open next time I got to come down here. Uh, you can also see another thing is the um, the sample port. You see the sample port. There's a little bit smaller lid. He has the vacuum in there and he's cleaning the sample port out. So that's always good. Sometimes those sample ports they get uh, they get a little abusive or they get they get abused. They they don't get cleaned out. They get you know no one cares about them. They clean the grease traps out and they get they get going. So um, excuse me. That's nice to see them. They'll make sure they clean them out and they power wash them as well. So I've sometimes seen buildup inside of the, the sample port and that's caused a SSO because the sample port's not being cleaned up. And more and more now that the sample ports are being uh, input into the system, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's more likely that these folks are going to start implementing that into their services saying, oh, okay, well, we also do uh, sample cleaning as well. So that, that's also nice. But yeah, again, you can see him cleaning off the ring and lids kind of going of, uh, above and beyond. I'm not going to say that's probably why he was doing it because I was standing there. Uh, but I'd like to believe that he does it when the inspector's not there as well, uh, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good of them. So, uh, but yeah, that's essentially what it looks like. Uh, it was a hot day. You can see he had his uh, sons out guns out that day, which was uh, pretty cool of him. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Well, there you go. Uh, if y'all have any questions, I'll answer some questions. But again, that's that's pretty basic. Uh without keeping you guys here all day, um, essentially what we look for and, uh, you know, cradle to grave when it comes to these grease traps. <laughs> but I had unmuted myself there. Uh, and he was going to say thank you for your presentation. Um, really gross, but really cool pictures of all of the grease traps. Um, looks like we have one question so far from Alexandra. What or whose software slash database do you use for the electronic trip ticket submittal? Can you share a copy of that form? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. So that's Linko as well. That's the, the same company that we use that we use them for our pre-treatment. And, uh, but yeah, so they essentially Linko, you can buy their, uh, their program there and, uh, and then they just have different things that you can add on to it. So, um, that's one of the modules that we're able to add on and, uh, that form you can customize it however you see fit. And we were able to look at it. Uh, it's L I K L I N K O. I'm sorry. I don't know what that noise is. Sorry. There's some background noise. So it's L I N K O. It's a Linko. Yeah, that's it right there. Uh, but they've been really good folks. They've, they've really helped us out. Linko, again, is a database that we've been using for a long, long time. But 
uh, with with new budgets and stuff and prioritizing things with council, we're able to get a little bit more funds to uh, buy more of the modules. And another module we really didn't talk about too much was a remote inspector module. And uh, next budget year, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, 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 get into that. So that's essentially going to be that form that Elijah showed that we look for inside of uh, an inspection that's going to be electronic. So we'll go into that and we're able to input all that database on that remote inspector and then boom, it shows up into Linko and it will able to transfer. It'll be able to transfer all that information that we saw during that inspection right to the database and be uh, very, you know, a lot more efficient than having to go back and and then input all that manually. So that's essentially what we're going going for. Awesome. And I missed a question from Echo earlier. Um, is there a variance for allowing inside traps if outside will not work for some reason? Um, so anybody can apply for a variance. Um, and there has been some instances um, where it's it, it has been uh, feasible. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, there is a, a hospital that had a certain coffee company come in and they they proposed a 1000 gallon grease trap. Everything was fantastic. The plan reviews were approved. And when they started digging, pulling utilities, they found out that the um, the th this coffee place was surrounded by fiber optic um, communications for the entire uh, hospital. So with that, there were they weren't they weren't able to put a, a grease a, you know large grease interceptor outside. It had to be inside in order to not damage anything. Um, I don't want to be the person who says, yeah, I made them put a grease trap out here and they damaged some lives, damaged uh, some lines and maybe lost some lives. I don't I don't want to be that guy. So uh, so yes, yeah, that is a variance and I mean it, it can happen. I I always tell folks you can apply for a variance. Um, most of the time, that's not the case. It's just because folks don't want to uh, put a bigger grease trap in because of the cost. Uh, but essentially, what we do is, um, you know, if they want to apply for a variance, we'll look at everything. I'll have them give me a menu, uh, you know, the grease trap size, and uh, me and Elijah will sit down and we'll go through it and we'll we'll talk about it and see, you know, what what our, uh, you know, what we can do. Um, but yeah, there there is instances that we can do that. Um, I have one from Kathy here. Does Irving charge or not charge for inspection? Um, so for CO inspections, there is a charge that um, the inspections department does charge. I, I want to say I think it's uh, I think it's around I think it's about a hundred bucks now. I think it's between eighty to a hundred dollars now, and uh, that's essentially to have a courtesy inspection, and that has all the inspectors uh, go out there. And uh, if it's a food establishment, again, that's building inspector, fire, uh, myself, and health. Um, but depending on what it is, yeah. So they charge. We don't we don't see it. those funds don't come to us. They don't get uh, allocated to us or anything like that. But if I'm just doing a compliance inspection, we don't charge for them. No. Awesome. And then Alexandra also asked if you could share a copy of the notice of violation as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. I can. Um, that's my information. If you want to uh, write that down or get my phone number there, I'll be happy to, to send you as, uh, as many as you want. I'll give you one. I'll write you one if you want to. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, and I will say on that note, um, we'll make sure that today's presenter's contact information is in the follow up email as well. So that way, if you have any burning questions after that we can't get to, um, we can discuss those later. So I have another question from Edwin. Is power washing the grease trap a requirement or a benefit of the cleaning service? Um, so it's a requirement. Um, it's not in our ordinance. Eddie's desk is right across from mine, so he should know. Uh, but uh, he, uh, but yeah, it, it is it is a requirement, and we do preach that to our um, our waste haulers. So it's kind of our way of placing BMPs to our waste haulers to say, hey, look, these are things that we um, ask of you guys to do, and we have found that it is beneficial um, to both you know the the generator and. Um, the city. So it's something that we do require. Um, it, it is in writing. You know, we do have a pamphlet whenever they do come into Irving and want to be a uh, permanent waste hauler. So we do require them. Yes. Awesome. Mr. Edwin King. And then I see that Todd has his hand raised. So Todd, I'll go ahead and let you unmute yourself if you'd like and ask a question. Uh, 
Yes, uh, you know, earlier I brought up all this thing about variants and large separators and that question about the uh, clean out, you know, power washing. Um, years ago, when I was dealing with earlier ordinances, they were requiring a that clean out and 100 percent pump out. Anytime you're doing service and I thought I'd bring up something very unusual. And as I said, you know, I formerly worked with Dart. We had this very large separator. We also put pre traps on it to catch the grit. So it effectively becomes an oil water separator. And I dealt with, again, this was back in early 2000s, an inspector that was wanting to insist of doing 100% pump out and clean out of this separator. And we were trying to work with the manufacturer and 25% rule. And when you're dealing with an 11,000 gallon separator, 100% clean out is very, let's say that's a very huge waste of water. And I just thought I'd mention it every now and then you run into these 1%, you know, very specialized design systems that really don't fall, you know, your ordinances become a real problem. It took me months to get uh, the city to provide an exception because the ordinance was written without any uh, options for variance. So just thought I'd bring that up or see if you had any comments on that. It's an unusual case. Yeah, it is for sure. That's that's something uh, they were giving me a little bit of backstory here about uh, about that. I guess a couple of our folks here knew about that. So um, but yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. I mean, I don't have anything uh, to add to that, but yeah, that's definitely interesting. <clears throat> oh, and that was not the city of Irving, by the way. You may have had something similar, but the one I was really thinking of was not in Irving, but um, it's just that it, uh, I was trying to come in and convince them that we have a much better uh, procedure where in that particular case, we were doing extremely frequent taking the oil off the top of the separator, but also very frequent cleaning of the pre-traps to avoid the um, sludge and grit from going into it. So we would, it uh, was a very unusual case on that separator. We would almost not need full cleaning for years the way we were maintaining it, but we were constantly taking oil off the top and pre-cleaning so the grit and sludge wasn't going into it. It's unusual, except you, that 1%, it's good to know about unusual things. How yeah, yeah, abso absolutely. And, th and that I think touches on a little bit of uh, preventative maintenance uh, from place to place, you know, just because these variances or not variances, I'm sorry, these frequencies are set uh, doesn't mean you have to go to uh, go to them or, or, you know, as long as you don't exceed them. But I tell folks that like you don't have to do it every 90 days. If you find a better way, I mean, at the end of the day, you want to protect your own plumbing. If you feel like, you know, you could do like you were saying, you know, there's different PMs of, um, you know to protect you know your your sanitary sewer then by all means yeah get creative with it i guess and you know that's that's one way of, of finding out uh you know how to do things awesome okay so i've got a question from david and ernesto at the city of mansfield um Conco does not charge per trip ticket entered into the system no they do not and again that was a big selling point for us we had a little bit of pushback. I say a little bit, a lot uh, from the different waste haulers. And that was kind of my used car salesman selling point to be like, hey, you know, we don't have to buy trip tickets anymore. And also y'all don't have to, uh, y'all aren't going to be charged for each uh, manifest entry as well. So no, they, they do not. I know they did have the option too, but we opted out of uh, that. Awesome. Thanks. And I've got a couple questions about grease traps on food trucks. Oh, the uh, that's that's Mr. King again. Uh, yeah, so uh, we don't inspect grease traps on food trucks. Uh, they are permitted uh, with the health department. We really don't have a whole lot to do with them. Irving does not have a um, a place to 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 drop any of this off, um, to drop any of the gray water or grease traps or anything that are on board. Uh, I think the closest place they go to is Grand Prairie to to do that. Um, but Irving does not have any locations to uh, get them serviced. 
um, get those those uh, grease traps. They've tried. Um, they I've ran into a handful of people where they say, well, I contracted or this food truck came to us and said, if we can use our grease trap, you know, is that allowed in Irving? And with uh, within our ordinance, you know, it's one grease trap per business. So even if it's a food truck or anything else, we don't allow them to dump into another uh, grease trap, even if it is oversized or anything like that. It's uh, one business per grease trap. And uh, again, that's, you know, we just don't want most of the time when they do a grease trap, it's, um, you know, it's plumbed and it's calculated for the existing plumbing. So just adding on to that, just asking for uh, problems. But Mr. Uh, Edwin can contact me if he has any issues. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so we're running out of time. Um, so I have a couple of questions um, that I wanted to pose to our speakers today. So I might just ask one of them. Um, I'm curious how you, how you decide at what point your education turns into like enforcement action. How long do you sit there and educate people for until you say, okay, you're getting slapped with a ticket or a fine or something else? Um, I mean, it, it's a case by case for us. Um, but most of the time, you know, we run compliance reports. So after those compliance reports, and they're a little scary, uh, they say, hey, if you don't get your grease trap cleaned out, essentially, uh, you're going to get a thousand dollar ticket. So usually that's like, oh, okay, I don't want a thousand dollar ticket. Um, so, you know, that's usually the, the first uh, education enforcement, I guess we can do. So, um, you know, the way I like to look at things is, is this isn't your first rodeo. You've owned this restaurant for X amount. Like you should know, like this isn't, this isn't new news. So, you know, I don't, I don't like to, um, to think that these folks are just, I mean, out of the blue. I mean, this, this is just part of it. Uh, so again, you know, it's usually sticks with one notice of violation. And after that first one, uh, then yeah, we, we go straight into whatever we, you know, whenever, whatever we need to do, writing tickets. Uh, but I'm telling you, working with other departments has helped so much. Um, usually if I write a compliance letter and, um, they still don't get it done then me the fire marshal and health in inspector like to show up all at the same time and we'll do a cat inspection and uh from there uh they you know that that tends to uh, catch their attention more than anything else so you know there's there's different ways of you, you know enforcement i guess you can say but uh it's it's more educational i guess you can you know, put it in both ends Absolutely. Uh, Madison, what about y'all in South Lake? How long do you educate for the non-compliance before enforcing? So um, we usually, with like the Welcome to South Lake folders, that's kind of like our first attempt to get to know them, get familiar, kind of form that relationship. So we count that as like an educational measure as well as the initial inspection because oftentimes people will be like a property manager or a um, restaurant owner will be on site for that inspection. So we use that as another opportunity to educate them about their interceptor and what's going on with it. Um, and then after that point, we'll start with notice of violation. Um, so the first one's just a letter and it'll tell them everything that's laid out. And then the second one is where we actually show up with the letter and explain again, like this is important and this is your deadline to make these repairs or to clean or to whatever's mandated in that letter. And then after that point, if they still don't meet a deadline, we'll pursue um, a citation. And a lot of times we found that um, whenever we do show up with the citation pretty much ready to go, they've actually done some type of action, whether it's submit a permit or they've contacted a plumber or they're in the process. So we'll usually drop the citation at that point. We really use enforcement kind of like Irving as like a last measure after education. But there's also a point in time when people We'll just you know don't want to take care of something so that's when we'll proceed awesome thanks okay so i will open it up to the group um for maybe just a couple of questions or a little bit of discussion before i move into some closing remarks um so if you'd like to raise your hand and unmute yourself or type something in the chat box we'd love to hear from the audience today all right, I know we're getting pretty close to lunch, so we may not hear anything. So I will jump right into some of my upcoming water activities that we have going on. Um, quickly approaching is FY 2022. So um, the work program is now available and the cost shares will be open to accepting commitments very soon. Um, like I stated at the beginning of today's workshop, 
our activities for the water roundtable are not possible without all of our cost sharing member support. We greatly appreciate it and would love to have y'all back next year. Um, our next water meeting is scheduled for October 7th, 2021 at 10 a.m. This one will be in person in the regional forum room um, at NCT COG offices in Arlington. So at the last water meeting, attendees elected to host one in-person meeting and three virtual meetings each fiscal year. Um, so we're going to start off the fiscal year with that in-person meeting so we can just get us started off on the right foot. And then on the topic of Greece, the 2021 Holiday Greece Roundup is also quickly approaching. It's scheduled for November 22nd, 2021 through January 10th of 2022. Um, it is a free event for those located within the North Central Texas region. So if you want to participate, please shoot me an email. Um, my contact information will be on the last slide and in the follow-up email. We will be formally announcing the roundup uh, later on in September or October. So um, you don't have to make a decision right now. But I just wanted to give a huge thank you to our presenters for volunteering their time and effort so that this workshop could be a success today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to share this great information with us. Um, we think that this was a great success and so happy that we were able to do it. Um, and as a reminder, the workshop slides and recording will both be posted online and sent directly to all registrants. If you did not register before today's workshop, you can send me an email. Um, I will also drop my email in the chat box for anybody that uh, would like to send me um, their contact information to make sure they get a copy of that. Um, with that, it is noon on the dot. So thank you guys again. We will see you in October.